Uh, good evening, everyone. This is Kevin Haroff, uh, this year's uh, mayor of the city of Larkspur and um, member of the city council. I want to welcome everyone to the regular meeting of the Larkspur City Council for Wednesday, June 16th. Uh, and we're starting a few minutes late because we've had some technical uh, issues. Yeah. We've had some technical issues um, and um, we're still trying to resolve them. So if you hear some strange voices wafting in and out, that's that's the reason for that. Uh, so uh, welcome everyone. Again, we're uh, continuing our practice that we've had for the last year of conducting these uh, city council meetings by uh, video teleconference uh, only. Um, there is information for members of the public to join us on Zoom on our uh, on our agenda. So we welcome uh, anyone from the public to join uh, in that way. There's also call in uh, uh, telephone numbers in case um, the video doesn't work, which is the problem we've been having here. So uh, with that, why don't we go ahead and take a roll call? Council member way here. Vice Mayor Hilmer here. Mayor Haroff. And I'm here. I'll note that council member Candell and council member Paulson are absent. But that still leaves us with the quorum so we can uh, move forward and we'll move to agenda item number two, which is public comment. Um, this is a time for members of the public to provide comments on items that are not on the agenda uh, for tonight. Uh, and we welcome anyone to uh, provide comments uh, in that context. Um, please keep in mind that uh, we need to keep any comments uh, limited in time. If possible, individuals should keep their comments limited to three minutes. Um, and if there's anyone that is um, speaking in representation of a group, uh, a little bit more than that, but certainly no more than uh, five altogether. Uh, I think we received some public comment letters um, but we'll move to see if there's anyone who is in the public that would like to take the opportunity to speak to the uh, council and the public. Our first comment will come from Robin Mahler. Okay, Robin. Uh, good evening, Mayor Haroff, uh, City Council members and staff. This is actually David Mahler. David Mahler, yeah, I get, you got me confused there. Go ahead. Yeah, well, it, it comes across as Robin. Um, as you know, I live here in Larkspur, and uh, I, I recognize that the council will be considering its Climate Action Plan 2030 later on in the agenda, so I won't be commenting on the cap now. Uh, what I would like to share now is that earlier today, on behalf of the climate uh, group, Larkspur Climate Group, I submitted a draft climate emergency resolution for future consideration by the council. The purpose of a climate emergency resolution, which is often called a CER, is to clearly identify the climate crisis as an emergency requiring urgent action and to state Larkspur's resolve to consider climate impacts in its decisions and actions. Most of the S Sonoma County jurisdictions and six of the Marin County jurisdictions have adopted CERs, Fairfax, San Anselmo, Novato, Corte Madera, Tiburon, and literally just yesterday, Marin County adopted a CER. The recently adopted Corte Madera CER is a good example for Larkspur, and the draft Larkspur CER that I submitted earlier uh, today is generally modeled after Corte Madera's climate emergency resolution. It's a good time for Larkspur to adopt a climate emergency resolution in conjunction with adopting its Climate Action Plan 2030. The difference between the two is that a climate emergency resolution declares the urgent need for action and Larkspur's resolve to act. What the CAP does is describe the specific detailed actions that Larkspur will take. The two documents are complementary with each other. So I'll be commenting on uh, the CAP a little later uh, during the meeting when that agenda item comes up and I and uh, the rest of the uh, Larkspur Climate Group look forward to working with the council and staff uh, toward adopting both the climate action plan and a, a climate emergency resolution as well. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for those comments. I appreciate it. Is there anyone else from the group who wants to speak? Looking for any further raised hands or any emails, public comments. 
And there is no further public comment. Okay, good. Well, then we'll conclude the uh, public comment for matters not on the agenda and move to agenda item number three, which is presentations and proclamations. The only thing that we uh, have here is um, on schedule is a legislative update. Correct. All right. Uh, good evening, Mayor Hoff and members of the City Council, as well as members of the community. My name is Shannon O'Hare. I'm the assistant to the City Manager, and I will be providing a very brief legislative update this evening. Um, a couple of times a year, city staff will maintain the practice of updating the council and the community on the California state legislature and the um, the bills and the uh, legislation that's passing through that body. Just to provide a really quick update for folks who may not know or overview, there's three, br three branches of the California state government, the governor's office, the assembly, and the Senate, which is the legislative branch, and the judiciary. In Marin, our representatives, our assembly member is Mark Levine, and our senator, state senator, is um, Mike McGuire. Um, the legislature works on a two-year session, so we are on year one of year two of the session, so bills can be introduced this year, and if they don't make it through the process, they can stay in play and potentially move forward or be amended, et cetera, the next year. Um, the, legislator, the legislature uh, reconvened on um, early this year um, on January 11th. And then uh, just to give you a timeline, on February 19th, that was the last day for bills to be introduced into the legislature. Um, and then June 4th, this recently passed, was the last day for bills to pass out of the House of Origin. So if you were a state assembly member and you were proposing a bill uh, that was the last day for the assembly to vote on it before it moves on to the Senate and starts working through the Senate process and vice versa. Um, July 16th, they will go into summer recess um, before reconvening on September 10th, that will be the last day for the legislature to pass bills. And on October 10th for this part of the session, um, that will be the last day for the governor to pass bills. So in terms of where we are in the session and how work moves, we're like a little over halfway through. We're really uh, the beginning of the session. A lot of times there's a lot of groundwork happening and as bills pick up and pick up speed and get moving, we're about, we're about halfway through. Um, so at the beginning of this year, we were still very much in COVID mode. A number of things had changed at the state level, including the fact that the shortfall at the state level for the state budget was smaller than it was assumed um, in terms of the contraction for uh, COVID-19. Um, however, there were still a number of protocols that were in place in the legislature to uh, account for the COVID situation in terms of actually scheduling the physical rooms and how bills could be heard and the, the um, limitations on that. So last year, if you were here for the last update in October for last session, uh, the, the volume of bills that were both introduced and passed was far below what a normal session would be. And this year there was also a limitation in order to prioritize bills that really uh, were of interest to pass. Um, most bills are still very much in play and very much in process. Uh, there are a number of, in, in terms of what's pertaining to local government, there are a number of broadband bills that are still in play, as well as a number of housing bills that have been brought before. One that I would like to uh, bring to the council's attention and update the community on that is um, very much moving forward at this point is SB9 um, from Senator Atkins. It's a housing development and approval bill. It will require a local government to ministerially approve a housing development containing two residential units in a single family residential zone. Um, it would also require local governments to ministerially approve urban lot splits in a lot of situations. Um, for folks who don't monitor our planning commission meetings for fun or read planning documents for fun, the takeaway for this for a community like Larkspur and some of the concerns are the fact that a lot of land use has very much been a, a local control issue and something that cities and communities really decide how lands are used through our zoning ordinance, through our general plan update, through um, certain processes. And this would very much limit the ability for both staff review and then elected review um, in terms of how housing can be used in the community. That passed out of the Senate and is now in the assembly and in the assembly process. Um, both MCCMC, the um, Marin Council of Mayors and City Council members um, took an opposed stance to this as well as the League of California Cities. 
Um, another bill that is not immediately um, pertaining to Larkspur, but might be of interest in terms of generally um, the mayor had talked, I don't remember if it was before the meeting or right at the beginning of this meeting about how Zoom is with us and how we will adapt to virtual meetings and hybrid meetings as we emerge from um, the public health orders of COVID is AB 339 from Assembly Member Lee. This would not affect Larkspur. This is a bill that would um, impose a number of mandates on local public agencies by requiring them to provide both in-call and internet-based internet options for their uh, community meetings. This would not apply to Larkspur. It applies to communities, I believe, over 250,000, where the population is over 250,000. But it's of interest to us because this will likely become a best practice. So it may not look exactly this way and we may not be on the same timeline um, as larger communities, but I think a lot of this will trickle down in terms of both expectations and then how our, um, how our neighbors practice community meetings and how community meetings evolve. And this bill's also um, moving forward. So that's the, the conclusion of the update for now. As the, um, depending on how the um, session progresses, we'll schedule another one of these as necessary. And then certainly at the, when it's a wrap on the session in terms of what passed, what didn't pass, and what the takeaways are, we'll, we'll update the council and the community again. So it's the conclusion of the presentation and I'm available for any questions. Okay, well, I, I have a question that I'll get to, but first open it up to the rest of the, the council. Comments and questions? Thank you for that report, um, Shannon. And the next MCCMC legislative meeting is at the end of June? Yeah, fourth meeting, fourth okay. Monday of the... I'll be there. Yeah, unfortunately I, I won't. Um, so I'll be interested to hear what discussion is uh, conducted at that at that meeting. Um, just, just, a, just unless there's others from the council who have a question, I just have a question you mentioned that um, the, the League of California Cities and maybe some other groups that we have an affiliation with have submitted, um, uh, have taken positions in opposition to SB9. SB9 is, is um, uh, troubling. Um, and I know that I, in my own individual capacity and many people I know have submitted letters and called uh, representatives to express their uh, opposition to that. Are other cities just beyond what the, the league is doing uh, also um, uh, uh, submitting uh, letters? And is that something that might be helpful for us to consider? And that's as much have... a question for you as it is for the council. Yeah, so I can answer the point of information where uh, I believe a number of our neighbors have submitted letters on behalf of their councils to oppose SB9 at this point. We have not. I don't have the, I don't have the information up here, so I don't want to speak to specifics. Um, as and if this bill progresses through the assembly um, and as it gets closer to a vote, I think that would be, it would likely be on an agenda for the council to consider at that time, um, submitting a letter of opposition as it gets closer. And is, is, is the timing such that we could have a letter teed up and ready for consideration and approval the next council meeting before action is taken at the legislative level? I just don't wanna miss an opportunity if we have one. Well, the city clerk is our our next meeting. I believe is canceled. July twenty first. Is July twenty first. So it would be at that point. My guess is it might be. I will have to double check on the timing of that. Yeah. Um, to send a letter before the council, but in terms of the actual staff time and effort for that, um, for that bill, etc. If if need be, it would be pretty quick for staff to put together work wise. Okay. Uh, well, since we don't have a council meeting until uh, in July, is there another way, and maybe this is a question for our city manager to get that teed up? Shannon, I, uh, I didn't catch, did MCCMC already take a position on this yes. bill? Yes. MCC has not... sent multiple, so not to get too, too in-depth in this bill, MCC has sent, legislative committee has sent multiple letters on this. So there was a letter when okay. the bill was introduced, and at that point, it wasn't opposed unless amended. And um, I think a number of folks who were concerned about this bill, um, in, including the, the league, uh, both tried to work with the author and some of the supporters to get some amendments in that would maybe lessen the concerns for local control and those amendments were not taken. So there was a second letter sent that was an opposed letter. 
So with that, Mr. Mayor, the council's practice for many years has been to allow the mayor to write a letter that says Larkspur joins the MCCMC in whatever position. So we could do that easily with, uh, and it would be consistent with the policy and practice of the council. That sounds like a perfect thing to do, unless there's an objection from others on the council. Why don't, why don't we go ahead and do, get that done? Okay. I don't have an objection. This is Dan Hilmer. I don't have an objection to that process, but I think it's in the public interest for the council to have at least a, uh, I don't expect a lot of uh, unnecessary work to go into it, but at least a, some sort of discussion, maybe even a, a, an overview of what the legislation um, proposes to do. But, you know, what we're, I just heard two contradictory statements. One, one was, um, we don't, basically we don't have time to talk about it, but let's get a letter in. And I don't, I think that leapfrogs a step, which is having a public discussion of what it is we're about to oppose. I would appreciate that just for my own information. If we, if, you know, and I don't expect um, this to be an obstruction, but I, I think it's part of a process that makes sense if people are watching what we do. I think that to accommodate the vice mayor, Mr. Mayor, then you should call for a special meeting of the council. Um, I guess that's what we would have to do. And we can, um, inc we can include like legislation. I just think the issue, even if it amplifies the concern, I think it's worth having a, uh, at least a illustrative examples of what this means for our community. So I think, Mr. Mayor, why don't we uh, take that as direction and offline we'll poll the council and schedule a special meeting. I think I think that's fine because I, I think this is an important issue for us and I, I want to make sure we're not missing an opportunity to make sure our views are, are heard. So if you could do that, um, Dan, I, I think that would be a good idea. Any okay. other, any other uh, thoughts or comments from the council on this? Um, Allison, do we see anybody from the public who wants to uh, uh, chime in? Looking for any ways, hands from our audience members or any emailed public comment. And there is no public comment. Okay. Well, uh, thanks for that update, and we'll uh, we'll go ahead with um, taking the next next step on on that particular legislation. And I uh, look forward to hearing uh, uh, what we're able to do on that. So that'll conclude item number three, agenda item number three. We'll move to agenda item number four, which is approval of the consent calendar. Um, all the matters listed on the consent calendar are normally considered to be routine and enacted by a single uh, vote, um, unless, and there will be no separate discussion of individual matters unless um, uh, they are removed. Uh, from the consent calendar at the request of a council member or the public. So is there anyone on the council who would like to remove an item on the cons consent calendar for separate consideration? Seeing none, uh, let's ask if there is anyone in the public who would like to separately have us consider an item on the consent calendar. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members. And there is no raised hands, no public comment. Okay, good. Well, in that case, I'll entertain a motion for approval of the consent calendar. So I'll move approval of the consent calendar. And I will second that motion. That's great. Um, so let's Council. have a vote. Council member way. Yes. Vice Mayor Hilmer. Yes. Mayor Haro. Yes. So with that, the consent calendar is approved and we will move on to uh, agenda item number five, which is our city manager's oral report. Dan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I actually want to start my report by showing a video. So if you'll be patient, I will try to get that up here. Uh, this was a news report that I wanted the community to see in case folks hadn't had it and then I have an additional follow-up comment. So uh, see I, is this up on the screen now, the news yeah. report? Okay. I see it, but I'm not hearing it. Uh oh, hang on, it's not sharing the audio. Let me correct that. Uh, Allison, I might need a reminder on how to make sure it's, I think Sky actually educated me about this once before on how to do uh -oh. the audio. 
Yes, I would appreciate uh, guys' assistance. Okay. Oh, let me. I believe that if you go to um, under uh, the microphone button and under audio settings, uh, you should be able to set it so that. Oh, I found it. I found Great. it. Okay. <laughs> Let's try this again. Okay. Wide home inspection pro. All right. Here we go. Our prevention, as KPI X 5s John Ramos reports, they've just kicked off a countywide home inspection program designed to harden communities against disaster. This is a typical residential neighborhood in Corta Madera. It's not heavily wooded and doesn't look like the kind of place a wildfire could even happen. But that's what they thought in Middletown and Paradise and Coffee Park and Fountain Grove. Battalion Chief Todd Lando says Marin County has all the conditions necessary to become one of those places synonymous with tragedy. Yeah, we've been lucky. We've been dodging bullets. No reason that those fires didn't happen in Marin other than there wasn't an ignition at exactly the right moment. So last year, Marin voters approved Measure C, a parcel tax for wildfire prevention. With it, they've created the Defensible Space Inspection Program. Christy Casio and Nicholas McNamara are two of the 26 inspectors going door to door, surveying each house in Central and West Marin for fire hazards, like this juniper plant right next to Marco Terran's garage. Juniper in general is just flammable. Um, it goes up like a torch. Okay. So the teams log and photograph items of concern, like the missing screen from this eve vent that could allow embers inside the roof, or this popular fuzzy mulch called gorilla hair that acts as perfect kindling to ignite a fire. Homeowners are then given a special access code to review their property's report online. I think it's a great thing. Um, you know, everybody kind of has a responsibility to keep their own like local zone protected. The inspectors say people seem grateful for the information and while the reports are meant as helpful suggestions for fire hardening, Chief Lando says issues that pose a severe hazard will not be tolerated. We're trying to educate folks and there, there will be a few egregious properties that have significant deferred maintenance, let's call it, um, you know, that we'll follow up on and there will be some type of enforcement action taken. They say each person needs to take responsibility for their own property to cut the risk for everybody. What we don't want to see is paradise where over 12,000 homes were destroyed and, and we can get there. In Corte Madera, John Ramos, KPIX 5. All right, so I thought the council and the public might enjoy seeing that if you didn't see that on the news last night. Uh, it's really exciting, I think, for your staff to know that uh, because we invested our Measure C resources immediately in getting Todd Lando on board, you know, we're really setting the tone for how this program is going to move forward. And um, I did actually want to take this opportunity to remind the public that um, there is a tax Measure C behind making the Marine Wildfire Prevention Authority work. And there is a senior exemption in that tax. And the senior exemption is something you have to file for every year. And the filings need to be done by June 30. So if there are members of the community who uh, might qualify, I encourage them to go to the Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority website so they can read on how they can uh, determine if they're qualified for the exemption and, and apply for it. That was the other message I wanted to get out tonight uh, to the public. So I turn it back to you, Mr. Mayor. Dan, do you have a, a website address that we could refer the public to? Uh, the authority? Uh, hang yeah. On a sec. It is uh, marinwildfire.org. Okay, that's pretty straightforward. And, and also firesafemarin.org. They're working very collaboratively with the wildfire prevention um, ordinance. So firesafemarin.org is another one. Yeah, I'm not sure they'll they'll give you the info on the senior exemption at at uh, at that website, but they might be. But I know it's front and center at the Marin uh, Wildfire.org. Yeah, they have uh, the home hardening is really a key. The home hardening and vegetation management videos on there are really key to understanding a lot of what's going on. So FireSafeMarin.org. Okay, any other comments or questions for the city manager from council? Uh, any, anything from the public? Looking for any raised hands from our audience members. 
or any emails, public comment. And there's no public comment. Okay. Well, thank you for that report. We'll move on to item number six, council members oral reports. And I'll ask if any member of the city council uh, has a report to make this evening. I'm seeing shaking heads. <laughs> Nothing for me, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Uh, and I don't have anything either. So I think we're, we're in good shape. And unfortunately we're missing uh, a full slate, um, but I'm sure people who are not here tonight will catch up the next time around. So that will conclude um, oral reports from the city manager and council members. And we'll move on to agenda item number seven, which is public hearings. We have one item under this, which is item 7.1. Um, and as everyone has heard already, uh, tonight we will uh, uh, consider the Larkspur Climate Action Plan or CAP 2030. And I uh, will have a, a public hearing and entertain comments and consider a resolution. So if we could have a staff report on this item. Neil, have you, Planning Director, uh, Neil Top, have you resolved your technology challenges? This isn't a good sign. Nope. Doesn't sound like that, that he has. Well, Christine, are you able to come on? I am here, yes. Okay. Uh, we might have to sub in here and take care of Neil's start. So um, I will introduce best I can, Mr. Mayor, that uh, you have before you the Climate Action Plan 2030. This is the city's guiding document for uh, its own policies and procedures as it relates to taking action to protect the climate. Um, this is an update of an existing document. Uh, Ms. O'Rourke is the uh, brains behind the climate action plan. So uh, it's probably fine that she's taking over for Neil here. And I'm going to turn over to her to maybe give you a brief walkthrough of the plan. And um, oh, Neil might join us. And oh, some there of the is. can you hear me? We can, well, we can hear you. Yes. Okay. There we go. Yeah. I'm on my phone. Okay. I will now shut up and uh, turn it over to the smart people. <laughs> oh, not so smart. Let's see. Um, okay. Thank you, Mayor and members of the City Council. Bear with me. We're dealing with, you know, occasional technical difficulties as we get through the uh, uh, COVID circumstances. So uh, the Climate Action Plan is a document that contains strategies and actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, particularly on the local level. It's a strategy for uh, the government and a local community to uh, attempt to reduce its GHG emissions to help address climate change. And in the past decade, the city has developed and implemented many projects and programs uh, at both municipal and community level to reduce its GHG emissions beyond 15% below the levels by 2020. Um, so we've achieved that prior goal, and we've now updated our climate action plan for the next 10 years to address a GHG target reduction of no less than 40% below 1990 levels by 2030. Um, and we've prepared this and, in collaboration with the Marine Climate and Energy Partnership with the assistance of uh, Christine O'Rourke, the Sustainability Coordinator for MCEP. And um, also in conjunction with uh, the best practices, up-to-date measures and policies recently adopted by, uh, or otherwise under consideration by a number of other agencies within the county and within MCEP. Uh, we had presented our draft climate action plan to the council on March 17th. And we did receive a number of comments at that time, uh, a number of requests, uh, concerns to, um, emphasize somewhat the greater urgency of climate change and the concern uh, to attempt to create more public participation, participation by the community, and also um, to set more ambitious goals uh, for the programs and actions. Um, we subsequently held a public workshop on April 29th and we had an open comment period 
until May 14th. And we did receive a number of letters and a number of verbal comments within the uh, workshop. Uh, we evaluated those comments. Um, much of them are the, the written comments were attached to your to the staff report. And we've done several edits and additions to the draft cap in response to those comments, uh, including an implementation plan. Um, we have attempted to keep the, the climate action plan as it's built as largely a working document for staff and the staff to advise um, the, the elected and the appointed um, boards and committees uh, in their actions. So it's largely built as a uh, action and program document for the city. And uh, we've updated it and we've included a red line copy, which was not attached in the staff report, but is on our website. Um, so one can see the changes we've made. And I'm not gonna go through in detail all the changes just very quickly. We did add a what you can do list for the community right up front, uh, kind of an at a glance um, collection of a lot of uh, little recommendations that were in the document. Um, we've expanded the descriptions of, and of climate change, what it means and the impacts and urgency of the matter. Um, we provide a greater description of the regional and local impacts and the roles of the various levels of government and how they interplay with um, our strategies. Um, we also added a discussion on social equity to integrate climate action plan efforts to serve a more diverse community groups. Um, so we've uh, also added, uh, along with that equity component, um, a recommendation or an action for promoting financing, audits, rebates, incentives, and services at various, uh, by various transit and utility agencies. Um, we also made some adjustments, increasing the commute by bicycle mode share from one to 2% and adjusting the target for VMT, VMT reduction um, by bicycle use uh, to reflect the actual land area. So that was a correction, which is reflected in Appendix A on page A5. Um, and so with that, we do want to emphasize that public engagement is a major strategy towards the end of the, uh, it's the second to last strategy of the um, document and includes many actions to provide resources and opportunities for the residents and the businesses to um, you know, do their part to combat climate change. Um, we've also added the Appendix B and implementation table uh, that outlines all the strategies and actions and identifies lead departments or varieties of departments that may be involved in, um, in those actions and um, kind of rough time frame and the staff time and resources that would be needed for those types of asset, um, actions as well as the GHG reductions and the metrics. Um, we've tried to clarify these goals are minimum uh, and the document is a reflection of what is achievable in the time frame involved, uh, utilizing coordination of anticipated programs, funding sources that are currently available to the city or, or anticipated. Uh, the council can certainly direct staff to prioritize uh, resources or address specific programs and issues where it is deemed necessary or alternatively where new opportunities for collaboration and or funding arise. Again, this is kind of work within what we anticipate um, on our horizon. Um, and again, we've received, as you, you've received a number of comments, we had one additional late mail uh, this afternoon. Um, and uh, I can, I think, respond to those uh, if the council would like me to do that. Um, some of the comments probably require some additional um, activity or a work public workshop. Um, most of the comments or suggestions are fairly straightforward. Uh, some we might even call good ads, uh, definitely some good ads to the language that don't um, present any um, issues. We could add those in. It's a couple we probably want to massage a bit before um, um, you know, committing into the document, but we can go into that. I think if 
if you have particular questions on any of the uh, comments. Um, one of the items I did want to um, raise was uh, one of the comments relates to bicycle mode share. <clears throat> and um, there's a suggestion to increase that goal. Uh, we've gone from one, we've done the calculations uh, up to 2%. Um, and there's a suggestion to go higher. And I've talked with Christine about that and you could certainly set a higher goal. It doesn't necessarily change the GHG calculations as they're um, required by the, the formulas that we've inputted and I could let Christine um, kind of um, expand on that if, uh, if that's the council's wish. So we have provided the resolution for approval and adoption of the climate action plan. Um, and we can either make direct uh, changes if suggested or come back at another time for further discussion. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Any questions for um, for Neil from the Dan council? Hilmer here, I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Dan. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Neil. Uh, good overview. Um, since this is the second meeting, I think, of, of where we talked about this, and there have been a stream of public comment, I have a. Uh, I don't. I don't want to jump ahead of the conversation, but I. I have what might seem like a bottom line question for you or Christine regarding um, some of the suggestions in the most recent public comment. Not, not so much the content, but the idea of a vision statement and the idea that was even brought forth in the public comment this evening of an emergency resolution. I only bring that up because I heard the word urgency used by the director. And I want to know if the idea of a vision statement ahead or included with the um, what you can do suggestions, as you called them, would be helpful and if a emergence what what does an emergency or urgency resolution what does it do for us or what would it do to um, are there any negatives to that and i'll entertain replies from either you and or christine okay well um yeah there are two topics there and i i do have to apologize i for technical reasons, I missed the initial discussion on the uh, urgency ordinance or that um, as a item. Um, but the the urgency ordinance does present uh, some. Uh, uh, Neil, and, yeah. Neil, hang on for a sec. I'm not sure when this became an urgency ordinance. The, it, Sorry. The, the speaker no, the speaker presented a climate emergency resolution that he would like the council to adopt. It is not an urgency ordinance, which legally means something. My, right. my mistake if I use those words. I, uh, I meant to say emergency resolution. And, so, and just a, a question, since that was not agendized and it was not part of our public comment time, should we um, skip that a labor discussion on that or is that appropriate? I, I think it's, um, I, I don't think we need to have, I mean, I think it's appropriate to have some discussion of it, but it's not it's not part of what we would be acting upon tonight. And we may decide to put um, both of these autumn items off into an, I, another date. I think the city attorney is unmuted because I don't think he and I agree with what you said, Mr. Mayor. Okay, then please. I was just I, I think that a limited question and answer about the cl proposed climate emergency resolution in relation to the climate action plan is allowable, but I would um, encourage the council to limit any discussion since the climate emergency resolution is not on the agenda. Yeah, no, that, that's, that's my, my question was not intended to get into even what is would be included, but the idea of having an element like that as part of the introductory section of the plan, it's more of a structural question. And then we can talk about what might go in that. And I, you know, we have some suggestions presented. I just want to know about, about the, uh, the Neil, I think of, it, the... Neil, I think it would be really helpful if you take a step back or have Ms. O'Rourke define the purpose of a cap, because I think the correct response is what the council wants the purpose of this document to be versus what 
by law it's intended to be. Yeah. Thank you, oh. Mr. City Manager. Are we talking in relationship to the vision statement? I think I think more simply, there may be some misunderstandings about what the purpose of a cap is in general, and it may be worth it to underscore that point. And then if the council wants to add additional meaning beyond the purpose of the document, that's a council discussion. Okay, so the, the purpose of the climate action plan is very simply to lay out um, a suite of strategies and actions that the local government will take to reduce emissions in the community. So it, you know, with the requirements of a climate action plan is that there is some inventory of emissions, that there is a projection of emissions going into the future under a business as usual scenario, and that it quantifies reductions that are anticipated through state actions and through local actions, and that those kind of work in concert to meet a longer term goal. And the goal itself is typically, um, it, it's typically either meets whatever the statewide goal is. And this is, you know, short term, we're looking at 2030, because we know that there are state actions that are already in place, and there's state legislation that mandates that statewide emissions are reduced to a certain level by 2030. So we're looking at kind of 2030. And then we look beyond as well, what else will it take to meet the longer term um, goals that have been set by the state through executive actions and um, executive resolutions. So that, I mean, that's kind of in a nutshell what the purpose of the climate action plan is. It's, you know, you typically very um, data driven and data heavy and, um, and as far as including a vision statement, it's not something that I typically see in a climate action plan, but it doesn't mean that it couldn't be included. I think vision statements are generally in documents like, like a general plan. And they're, when they are created, they're done through a public process and um, you know, with a lot of community input so that it's the entire community's vision, not just a, um, you know, a, a, a subset of people. Um, it's really why I would never draft a, a vision statement to put into a climate action plan for, you know, for this model, for our model template that we're using through Marine Climate and Energy Partnership, because then it's kind of imposing an outsider or a consultant's view on a, on the city for a vision statement. So I think it very much um, needs to be developed through um, by the community. Um, as far as the climate emergency resolution, I would just comment that a lot of the other cities that have climate action plans are adopting these climate emergency resolutions. I think that I haven't looked at your draft one. I think as long as that it's um, not in conflict with the climate action plan or setting, um, you know, competing or different goals or targets in the climate action plan, I think it's fine. Um, a lot of the, the resolutions are really just to kind of elevate climate um, action planning and, and implementation of the climate action plan to a higher status within the, the, within the city um, for staff to, to really kind of look at everything through the lens of climate action, what the impacts will be and how every project that the city undertakes can, can work to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions. Okay. Thank you, Christine. That's very, uh, very helpful. And I, I apologize if I kind of jump, jump the gun in terms of what we would be able to talk about tonight or not talk about. But I think we're actually all on the same page on the scope of our of our consideration of this issue tonight. Thank you for your thoughtful uh, responses. Yeah, and they, they were very thoughtful. And I think that gives good guidance on moving forward. Anything else from the council? Yes, I, ha I have some questions. Go ahead. Um, so I, first of all, I'd like to thank you for that explanation, Christine, because that helped me in seeing what the framework that we're looking at. Um, I wanna thank the public members that are, many of them are here who spent a lot of time um, helping uh, tr clarifying and presenting their um, suggestions and corrections. Uh, I really appreciate how engaged you all have been in this. I'm, I'm wondering, Neil, if you could speak to some of these specific clarifications and corrections you made a comment that some are easy to incorporate and then others you would like to nuance. Are there, between these nine that uh, were submitted, are there ones that, should we go through each of them or are there ones that you think um, they seem to be pretty amenable the way they are? 
Well, I think to, to answer your question briefly before going through all of them, um, I'd say, you know, item number two and three are amenable. Those are, those are language we could add in. Um, the, uh, again, you know, I think we, Christine's done a good job of explaining how a vision statement would work and whether, how that would, what that probably needs to go through would be a, like a public engagement right. workshop and get in here. Um, and then I think uh, she could talk a bit to number two about the mobility share. And you know, I'll, so we, are, we are, we looking at the, are we looking at the same thing? I'm looking at um, LCT-C2 bicycling and micro mobility. And oh, I'm sorry, number one, that's the mobility share. That's the, that's the one I, I would probably have Christine kind of talk about to inform you what that really means. Um, number two would be fine. Two and three are fine. Um, in terms four, of five and four. Four, I four read as building and appliance electrification subsection C. Yeah. Um, we would want to massage that a bit so it's very clear that we would be adopting this in conjunction with the adoption of the 2022 CBC in conjunction with it no later than, but in conjunction. And the concern I believe the um, speakers had or the commenters had on this was that the word align kind of meant that it had to align with the CBC. We meant in terms of timing, not because the CBC may or may not include this level certificate of electrification. So we would modify it not to necessarily have that date because CBC will come out and it's typically adopted by that date Okay. Um, but we just want to do it in conjunction. And the same thing with um, our RE-C3 is we are planning and working collaboratively with the county and the other jurisdictions through NCEP to begin adopting these electrification codes and more stringent measures. measures. And we do anticipate that that would be done within the year uh, 2024, giving a little more time for that changeover. Um, so we would say no later than 2024, um, but not at the beginning, because we do want to, we'd like to work, make sure we're working collaboratively right. in time with the other jurisdictions. Um, six, seven, eight uh, are all fine. Those are good ads. Um, and in terms of nine, that's a little bit of additional work uh, and programming for staff, but not to a significant level. As long as we're doing implementation, that's adding some um, level of monitoring and publicizing our progress. So, so just to, to wrap up the, what these public comments were, it looks like number one, I heard you say the ambitious goal of um, five percent. Uh, we could change it to five percent rather than one to two for mobility, and that two seems fine. Three is fine. Four, you want to do a little bit of work on that one. Five seems fine. Um, of course, changing some of those dates. Six, changing some of those dates. Seven, eight, and nine look fine. So is there any reason, um, I mean, we'll have to discuss this, I guess, and vote on it, that we can't include those clarifications and corrections? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Say the last part. I couldn't quite hear it. So with, with those um, suggestions and clarifications and corrections. It sounds like you're um, there's just a few nuances that you need to change, but overall, you think that these could be in, implemented. Yes. Okay. And my next uh, question. Can, yeah, go ahead. Can I, can I quickly just have uh, Christine kind of clarify? I think for everyone to understand the the mode share versus the GHG reduction uh, in number one. That's the bicycling and micro mobility. Yeah, that's the goal of five to ten percent. Yes. Okay. So um, just to clarify, so the reduction itself is taken. It we use the California Air um, Pollution Control Officer's guidance, which is recommended by the Bay Area Air Quality Management District, to come up with the calculation for the reduction and what it's what it is. It's reflecting the number of miles of bike lanes and bike paths that the city is going to install 
um, and th by 2030. And those are kind of coming out of your bicycle and pedestrian plan. Um, there's also some, a few very sm small amount of emissions reductions that comes from the installation of bicycle racks. So setting a goal is fine and we can set the goal. It's just that it's not going to, and it may be that the, um, that it, we actually end up with higher use of those bicycle facilities than what's anticipated, but the calculation itself is based on studies that have been done and uh, substantial evidence in the record. So it doesn't change the, the, the greenhouse gas reduction calculation, but the goal can be whatever, anything. Yeah, and so, the goal itself can be applied to all, I think there was a comment, you know, that it's all short trips. We are applying the reduction to all short trips with, or, or all trips that start and end within the, within the jurisdiction, yeah. So I just have a few more questions. I understand a vision statement um, that where it really should reside and the process for that. So um, the second important gap that this uh, a group of residents asked to look at was, to provide guidance for reducing consumption-based GHG emissions. Can someone help um, educate me on that? Sure. The, um, the way we calculate emissions is that we're looking at certain emissions that are they're generally activity-based, they're occurring within um, Locksburg's boundaries, and they're emissions that we can reliably quantify and track over time. So we're looking at things like therms of natural gas that are consumed or kilowatt hours of electricity or vehicle miles that are traveled on local roads. Um, a consumption-based inventory is looking at all of those upstream emissions. So when you buy a product, the emissions that are created in the manufacturing of that product in China, and then bringing it, you know, transporting it here to the, to, you know, the United States, um, et cetera. It's also including airplane travel. All of those are um, very difficult to quantify. And so the air, the air Quality District did do that exercise and they did it back in 2016 and it used data that was 2013. And we include that chart in the, in the Climate Action Plan. Just as, you know, kind of as an FYI, this is the difference between consumption-based emissions and what we're inventorying. Uh, it's possible, you know, the Air District has not undertaken that project again, so we have nothing to compare it to. The data is pretty old. It's just that to include um, some kind of a target around that without actually being able to inventory and track those emissions, it's kind of not really a useful exercise. That said that, you know, we do hope that there are improvements in inventory methods and and um, and data so that we can one day track it. So having something in the cap about how we'll monitor that and we'll try to, you know, you know we'll, we'll integrate those different kinds of inventorying methods in the future, I think is completely appropriate. So the language that's suggested by um, the Larkspur um, Climate Action Group is to include, um, is to include what you can do and suggestions for educating and reducing um, consumption. Do you find a problem with that paragraph? No, um, no I don't think so. I mean, it, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't, it seems like it's um, right. a, philosoph yeah. a philosophical um, presentation I, and it didn't seem like it set up any barriers to it. No, I don't, I don't have a problem okay. with that at all. Okay. I think it was a good ad actually. You do? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then lastly, the number three, yeah. the important gaps, clarified GHG emission goals. Um, they made another suggestion, which is similar um, in far as it is uh, creating better awareness and education, if I'm reading that correctly. Are there thoughts about that one, that addition? I, I think it, I don't have a problem with that addition that? either. You yeah, but, and, uh, yeah, no, and I'm, I'm sorry if I wasn't quite clear. I think when I started kind of discussing these, I was trying to indicate we, we felt that those two items, number two and three, were reasonable ads and probably good ads into the, you know, the number two does, it's, it's making a commitment and saying, you know, the, the city's going to look for the ability to track um, 
commission, you know, um, uh, you know, inventory consumption-based uh, emissions. You know, that's a little bit more of a, a commitment, um, but it is kind of theoretical as these things come on and as it's practical. And then number three, we think is fine as well. Um, you know, those can be added to help clarify the, you know, Yes. Oh, th thank you for explaining that. I, I'm uh, appreciative of how much effort has been got put in um, by our community to uh, address this and provide the feedback. So thank you for explaining that. I understand where a vision statement and maybe a climate emergency resolution should be put on a different um, discussion level than this than tonight. Mm -hmm. so those are my comments. Thank you, Mayor Harrell. Anything else from the council? I'm not seeing, and there's only one other member besides me, so that's our vice mayor, And it, unless he has something. Nothing else, we'll, Mr. Mayor. I think we'll open it up um, to uh, public uh, comments at this point. Our first comment will come from, uh, I believe this will be David Mahler. Thank Go you. Ahead, David. <laughs> uh, thank you, and again, good evening, uh, Mayor Haroff and, and council members. That was a great discussion you just had, and uh, very, very helpful, I think, for giving some feedback uh, for the community members who, as you noted, have worked uh, pretty hard trying to, to come up with the best possible cap for all of us. And when I think about that, I, I really note that what the cap says is most of the reductions over this next nine year period have to come through the actions of residents, not the actions of the city, but actions of residents. And that's why it's so important that this cap become a document that's a living document, it's embraced by the community, and that the community members really use it to help change their, their behaviors uh, and, and move in, in the directions that are, are there. So that's why things like the visioning statement and so on are in there. It's not intended to somehow you know, uh, bind the city in some way. It's intended to help people think of the cap, not just as a bunch of incremental actions, but where does it get us? What, what happens, you know, it's, it's a vision. It's not intended to be, this is exactly what it'll look like, but it's to give that big picture of, you know, why are we doing all these things? Where does it get us? So uh, overall, you know, we find the cap to be very comprehensive, really appreciate all the, the effort that the uh, city uh, staff and, and consultants have put in to get the comments in there. Uh, you've gone over the comments that we uh, submitted and it sounds like most of them maybe with some minor tweaks are, are agreeable to uh, the, the staff. And that's the way we see it. We would love to have some sort of workshop or opportunity to sit down with staff and go through that and find just like uh, the director of planning, Neil Toff said, you know, there was that one statement around the way we worded it around when building electrification ordinance would be targeted. We have no problem with changing it to be consistent with the timing of that, that new code. It, it doesn't have to be a date. The main thing it needs to be some point in time, not about the content of the new code, not code not consistent with that. So we would love to get together and, and do that. Um, just one or two other thoughts I'd, I'd like to share. Uh, it does seem like maybe postponing uh, action on the cap tonight would be a good idea. Uh, there, this is a big complex document. It's gonna have huge impacts on the community and the members of the community. And it seems like we ought to get it right. And uh, you know some of the things that were just been talked about here uh, look like they need a little bit uh, more, uh, a little bit more work. Um, regarding the CER, I'm not going to get into that at all. But the question was asked about the relationship, and and I think Christine nailed it. The cap is really about actions. It's about data. What's the current inventory of greenhouse gas emissions? What are the specific actions? The CER is more a statement of urgency that the council recognizes our climate emergency as an emergency that needs immediate action. And then the cap is one of those actions. We're going to do all these things. So they really are standalone things. Uh, Council member uh, Way, you know, your idea of maybe doing a separate workshop for a visioning statement, that sounds great. We just took a stab at it. It wasn't intended to be the only vision, but we think it would be helpful. So, uh, you know, kind of to, to wrap this up, um, uh, we, we think the CAP is, is a great document. Uh, the additions that have been added in there uh, really help quite a, a lot. 
And uh, we would like to get together with staff and uh, iron out you know, any questions about those remaining items. And uh, we think we'll have a great document. Uh, the idea of, of even mentioning the climate emergency resolution at the beginning of tonight's meeting was it can really be a companion document. They, they serve two different purposes. Uh, as was mentioned, all six of the Marin County jurisdictions that have adopted climate emergency resolutions also have caps and they adopted it to get both of those, those views. So uh, we really look forward to working with staff on this and, and bringing it back maybe with the climate emergency resolution, work with staff on that as well. Okay, thank, thank, thanks David. And um, uh, are you speaking on behalf of the group? Um, Cause I kind of let you go over your three minutes. Yeah, you know, I'm, I, I'm sorry I went over uh, Mayor Harp. Okay. I did want to address a few things there. I really don't know how many people are on or exactly what they're going to say. Uh, I, I think generally I'm speaking, but people may have a few comments on their own as well. Okay, well, let's let's entertain that and with the encouragement of um, um, being succinct. Mr. If Mayor, there are other, if there are others, I, yeah, go ahead. May I make a quick comment before we take public comment? Sure. Um, I want to uh, thank the staff and Christine for uh, getting us to where we are tonight. And I, I want to remind um, the council that uh, the planning director used the, the word in a, in a very uh, high priority public engagement a number of times in his opening remarks. And I, I, uh, I understand and hope everybody sees this as just a continuation of what is a working process. So I really appreciate uh, the planning director, staff and consultants in engaging the public and getting us to where we are today. It's, it sounds very positive and collaborative. Thank you very much. And I think we, we all share those perspectives. So if we could uh, see if there's anyone else who's got their hand raised, uh, Allison. Our next comment will come from Ken Jones. And again, let's please try to keep the, uh, the comments since we've already heard um, uh, as, as brief as possible. Thank you. Sure, this is Ken Jones from Green Bray and I'm part of the Larkspur Climate Group and also uh, with 350 Marin. And I do want to thank all of you, the mayor and council members and staff and Christine for all the work on all of this and the public workshops that were held. I think it's really important. Um, we are in emergency and we are not moving fast enough. And I'm, I suspect even the goals for this 2030 uh, cap will have to be adjusted because the state goals, there was an article recently came out by Daniel Kamen and some other local scientists and leaders that said that uh, California is well behind in reaching their goals and, and to reach uh, even two degrees centigrade uh, as a cutoff point. So we really need to do these things, not just put them on paper. Um, and I would like all of our suggestions to be included. I just wanna mention on the, um, uh, uh, consumption-based submissions. <clears throat> San Francisco and Berkeley is in the process of um, inventorying them and, and uh, calculating them with a group called Ecodata Labs in San Francisco. Um, and since they are four times as much as what we are dealing with directly in the cap, um, and Marin has a tendency to consume, <laughs> it would be really nice if we could uh, join those other cities and, and try to do something about them. Um, that's pretty much all I have to say. Okay, thank, thank you, Ken, I appreciate that. Um, let's reset the timer here. Uh, anybody else from the public? Next comment is Suhaila Sikhan. Hi, I'm Suhaila Sikhan, pronoun she, her. Thank you staff um, for all your work in this, in this project. I support the comments made by the Larkspur Climate Group in the June 14th email, including a living community-driven vision statement. I urge council to adopt the changes and incorporate the language proposed in the aforementioned email um, in advance of approving the cap. I urge the acknowledgement of social equity as seen on page 16 to be further integrated in the definitions and background of climate change definitions on page one through five to avoid reading like an afterthought. I recommend council holds the approval of the cap to align with the proposed climate emergency resolution that was mentioned earlier this evening. I support Neil's proposal for an additional workshop 
with great emphasis on invitations to likes for youth to join the conversation and to continue to do so within the CAPS community engagement plans. I am excited about the CAP and likes for its future in climate mitigation and resilience. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, anyone else from the public? Go ahead. Next comment caller, 1402. Please state your name and, and where you're from, please. Uh, James Holmes, Larkspur. Uh, I have four comments and a question. My question is, what is the albedo pavement recommended on page 28? I don't recall hearing that uh, term in the measure B and C briefings I've had, and uh, I wonder what it is. Is it as durable and economical as regular pavement? And do we want pavement to be reflective as albedo pavement is, is described? That's my question. And my, my first comment is uh, I'd ask for a softening of the anti-parking provision on page 21. It's LCTC8. Um, a provision for, for flexibility uh, in parking requirements is certainly reasonable, but just saying uh, that we'll go with the minimum, only minimum, seems uh, too rigid and, and limiting. And uh, the statement that uh, less parking makes a city more walkable is just not true. It, it just means you have to walk further to get where you're going. I know parking is unfashionable in some quarters, but it's still practical and, and needed, especially for those of us who are, are seniors or are mobility uh, impaired. So I'd, I'd ask for softening uh, that provision. Uh, comment number two, I'd ask for deletion of the specific reference to a total ban on gas-related uh, appliances. Um, and encouraging this is certainly okay, replacement appliances, but uh, forcing it seems not only unduly invasive, but uh, it's uh, premature and unreasonable to force consumers to be at the mercy of uh, electric uh, providers in grid that are unreliable and expensive and as yet inadequate in terms of uh, transmission and storage. So let's, let's improve the grid before we coerce the consumers. Number three, I'm concerned about the requirement on page uh, 32, WRC5D, for, quote, residential waste audits, unquote. That seems a bit unduly in invasive. And finally, uh, comment four, I'd suggest that the section on sea level rise include a policy to explore ways to deter or limit the intensification of development in areas that are uh, vulnerable to sea level rise. I, I think that's a pretty standard environmental uh, recommendation. Uh, so I'd ask you to consider those four uh, comments and, and to uh, explain what the uh, albedo uh, pavement is. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, who's next? Our next comment comes from Ken Strong. Hi, this is Ken Strong. Uh, I live in Greenbrae. And first of all, I'd like to congratulate uh, or commend staff and uh, Christine on the workshop process. I thought it was really great uh, the way it was conducted and the comments uh, that were incorporated, et cetera. I'm part of the Larkspur Climate Group and support its recommendations. I do think it's important that we have language uh, as suggested in um, are in uh, comment uh, five and six relating to building and appliance electrification, calling for replacement of electric appli uh, gas appliances with electric appliances, either at um, time of replacement or at time of sale uh, based. And, and that's what I anticipate is gonna be coming in the new code um, from the California Building Commission. But I think you guys are doing great work. I think it's gonna be a great cap uh, when it's finally uh, approved. So thank yep. you. Thank you, Ken. Um, next in the queue. Next comment, Elise Simonian. Okay, Elise. Good evening, City Council. I'm Elise Simonian. I'm a 17-year 17 res 17 resident of Magnolia Avenue, and I'm here to support adoption of the Climate Action Plan with the changes suggested by that Larksburg Climate, or climate Group. And I also want to urge you to direct funding in the budget to implement this plan by budgeting for purchase or lease of zero emission vehicles for the city and by funding adequate staff or consultants to encourage the community to take all the many actions that are in the plan. And finally, I'd also like you to urge our police and fire agencies to adopt similar climate action plans. That concludes my comments. and Thank you for considering this item tonight. Yeah, thank you, Elise, appreciate that. Um, who's next? Next, Tom Flynn. 
Tom? Yes, uh, I also want to really appreciate all, of, I express my appreciation for all the great work that mayor, uh, council members, staff, consultants have done. And I, I'm also part of the Larkspur Climate Group. Um, I want to just make a brief comment about the consumption-based. I think that it is, in, in fact, a complex uh, thing to integrate at this time and have uh, you know, a data-driven approach to it. Um, and although you, you may not be able to at this point, I think it's good to have, as, have it as a goal. And uh, there is information out there that can be drawn from. Um, I think just, just generally, we're all quite aware that, that as residents of this country and particularly the Bay Area, per capita, we have a much higher consumption than most of the world. And the charitable organization Oxfam actually has done some work on this. And you might look up uh, Oxfam extreme emission inequality. Um, you know, the, the, the top 20% in income, which, which gets down to people with just about 50,000 in household income were responsible for over two thirds of the consumption based emissions. And, um, you know, the, the ones that are, that are most vulnerable are those that are the, the, the least in contributing to that. So in terms of forced migration, because farms are drying up in, in Central America and that sort of thing, I think we, we really need to do our part as, uh, as people who have contributed uh, and historically, you know, as a country that's contributed to most of the emissions. So thanks for your attention to that. Thank you, Tom. Uh, who's next? I'm looking for any further raised hands or email public comment. And there's no further public comment. Okay, great. Well, with that, let's bring it back to the council for a decision and discussion about how to proceed next. So I have a question just about one of our speakers. Uh, could you speak to what is Alvedo pavement? I was trying in my other laptop to look up that section. But sure, I, excuse me, I can respond to that. So albedo pavement is um, something that reflects the sunlight. And so it can either be done through, it can be done through a reflective surface or it can just be a light, lighter colored pavement. It's actually a requirement. It's a tier one building, um, green Cal Green building requirement, which you already have. So you're already requiring high, al high albedo surfaces for paved areas for new development. The, um, the, the measure here is to evaluate the use of it for your repaving of roads. And um, I know that Caltrans was looking at high albedo pavements. I don't know the, the, the situation right now, but I think that's, you know, the idea here is that the, the city will evaluate the use of it. Okay, any other questions? Um, seeing... I, I have a question. Go, yeah, go ahead. Go process. ahead. Um, <clears throat> it sounds to me like from the public comments, uh, especially regarding uh, refinement to the uh, draft presented to us this evening, that we need to continue the item. Am I incorrect in my perception? Um, Neil? Well, I think that's, I think that's a decision of the council. I think that, as we said, most of the, most of the measures identified, we're supportive of, and I think we've identified two that we would massage the language. I could probably give you sort of a, in terms of the, the dates um, and tying electrification to GHG emissions. I think the more outstanding question is whether the vision statement is something the council wants to, feels is necessary to include into the climate action plan. And that would be, that would require sort of a public outreach process and a workshop to and have a vision statement that really says, okay, this was done through, you know, some real broad community outreach and all that input. There's a number of 
nuances in the vision statement that I think reflect goals that may or may not have been, you know, have not necessarily been decided by the council at this point. And so, but your your <laughs> idea of continuing the public engagement to include a vision statement? No, not to not. I don't, I'm sorry, I'm jumping in there. I think I see Christine shaking her head too. It's not to include a vision statement. That's a separate process. No, to, to draft a vision statement would, so I would, think, requir would require public engagement. And I heard that as a suggestion. I'm wondering if, if the council agrees with that suggestion. I think our city manager has an observation to make. I think you're jumping ahead of a fundamental question. You know, only one jurisdiction has added a vision statement. And my understanding is they did that because they drafted their cap through a committee process and the committee felt strongly they needed to add a vision statement. It's atypical. It doesn't mean you can't do it, but I think you need to frame your decision as do you want this document to have a vision statement? And if you say yes, then we should take that as direction of staff that we need to figure out a process for the crafting of a vision statement. So what about this suggestion? Um, because I, I think we need to move along with this cap and make sure we start the implementation process of it. What if uh, we um, agree to the specific clarifications and corrections that we discussed and um, got a coll uh, the collaborative approach that was presented to us, including um, important gaps to address number two and number three? Because it looks like Christine and Director Toff didn't have uh, just a few uh, tweaking of some of the dates and language would work. Um, and we then finalize the cap with that suggestions and move on to a public process of creating a vision statement and perhaps an emergency um, uh, resolution. But that would be an addendum or um, in addition to the cap as a, as a supplement. Does that sound doable? I, I heard the, uh, one of the public speakers describe looking forward to working with staff to refine these documents. And I, I took that, and I'm, I'm okay with your suggestion, Council Member Way. I just wanna make clear that we're consistent and all on the same page as we move forward. And I, I kind of agree with that. I, I, even though some of the changes may be modest, um, I think it would be um, in the best interest of the public to have a, um, a, a revised document to make sure we all see what the language says. And I, I think we could probably have that teed up, I hope, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Dan Schwartz, the, at, at the next council meeting. <clears throat> Excuse me. And, and to get uh, to uh, clarify, Overall, do we want a vision statement, and do we and do we want the process moving forward to include the public engagement um, for that? Um, my opinion is I think we a vision statement would be um, a worthwhile exercise, but it could not. I don't want it to hold down the CAP. It could be something that we um, add in a we um, supplement it with. In my opinion. But Rather, doesn't doesn't the vision statement kind of set the stage for the actions as described by the public comment? I think it does, but the I so think, don't we need don't we need to like get that in place so we know what lens we're looking through as we take these actions? Well, I'm thinking of the timing of of the, the difficulty with the summer and the fall coming up and our staff's time to uh, to make that a separate um, process is probably. Uh, Correct me if you're if I'm wrong, Neil. But getting this done and finalized is a priority. Um, moving forward, a vision statement discussion uh, would probably be worthwhile. Dan, what do you want to say about that? Yeah, I think the question I'd like Mr. Toff to answer is: Is there anything in the new cap that we are not already on the path of doing that would matter? fundamentally in the next 30 days? Because if, if I suspect he's gonna say no, then we can go about business as usual. We're already doing quite a bit of this work and in 30 days you can adopt a cleaned up document. And it can be farther out than 30 days, I think, 
if you want to go through a public process to add a vision statement to the document. Mr. So. Mayor, Dan, uh, Dan here again. I heard from the public comment the, the words, this will be worth the effort, we need to get it right. So I, I take that to mean, let's uh, follow the city manager's direction and I still though need some clarification. Yeah, that you, I don't... That you, that the, I really need clarification from the three council members that you actually do want a vision statement because there's no example other than Fairfax to go look at. So I need some clarity that Larkspur wants to have a vision statement live in the stock. I heard nothing from any of the comments or council members questions or comments that would lead me to believe that it's, that it would be a problem for us to create a vision statement. So I think, I think it's- uh, uh, Other than, other than, other than timing. I mean, there, 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 to me, there's actually three things that are, um, that need to be addressed, maybe not here tonight, but there's the, there's the re revisions to the technical aspects of the cap, which we've mostly discussed tonight. There's a, a substantive issue about whether there should be or shouldn't be a vision statement um, attached to the cap. And then finally, there's an issue of whether we need to consider an emergency resolution, which we can't do tonight because that's not, not before us. So those are kind of three separate things. Um, it sounded to me that the first item, which is to make the technical adjustments to the cap has been presented, that can be done and be presented to the council for consideration and maybe approval at the next city council meeting. Um, uh, consideration of a, of a vision statement um, that uh, would, if that was included in that, that might delay our ability to get that done. Um, so my, my thought would be that we separate that out and have that subject to maybe an, another uh, process. Then there's the, the emergency resolution, which also seemed to be fairly straightforward and may need to be tweaked, but it could possibly be um, um, uh, um, uh, massaged a little bit and then presented at the same time that the cap is completed at the next city council meeting. But have a separate process for the vision statement to make sure that we do have appropriate levels of public comment um, for that. We don't need to decide how that, to do that tonight, I don't think. Um, but, I, but I would like, if possible, for us to move forward um, with consideration of those other two items, potentially at the next city council meeting, and I'd I like, like to, I, and I'd like to see the, I'd like to see the document as it re, it's revised, to before it's adopted. I like My that. concern, Mr. Mayor, is that uh, by not having the vision statement created, uh, at least in parallel with the refinements to the climate. Act, uh, action plan that we run the risk of having to revisit the climate action plan after we conduct the uh, public outreach to create the vision statement because there, it will be a, a, a constant uh, pushing to uh, and and rightly so given the uh, public concern about the issue I just want to make sure that we uh, have a process that is in its proper perspective and order so that we don't end up uh, having to come back over and over again because we have these separate conversations um, about something that's supposed to lead into the other when we're doing it in reverse. Can I, can I ask if Christine can comment on that, whether vision statements, I mean, you have a lot of experience with this, where do vision statements generally uh, fall within these within the cap process? Yeah, I, usually we don't do a vision statement for for a climate action plan. But um, you know, if a climate action plan had been developed with, uh, and I've worked on them when, with committees, you know, a council appointed committee, um, then the the vision statement would have been. Like, like for a general plan would have been developed within the committee and then it would have been brought forward to through the public process in a workshop and, and you know, available for comment. So that's how it, 
it would have been done. It does seem a little bit like, you know, you've already have the climate action plan and now you're trying to, to layer a vision statement over it. I don't, I don't know if the vision statement would be in conflict with the, with the climate action plan as it is written now. Um, but I guess that it would be a consideration. I just think there need, there, need to be, there need to be some boundaries so that we uh, create something that we can implement. And I, I don't want the vision statement to, um, or a public engagement uh, workshop uh, to uh, be a separate process from the climate action plan. And I don't think it needs to be. I heard Christine say it'd be fine as long as it's not in conflict with the climate action plan. So I, I think a vision statement could be crafted pretty simply if it's within the uh, constraints and, and goals of, of the existing climate action plan as presented. So I, I, was, I was hoping that we could uh, have a public engagement workshop that would at least have a, have a focus and a goal related to the existing climate action plan and how a vision statement will support that. So, so here's a, a question maybe for our city manager. Um, Cause I heard earlier that, I mean, we do want to get on with the cap and I think it's important that we do that, but there, there's not necessarily a specific, you know, drop dead date for us to do that. Um, and if I'm right in hearing that, maybe there's a way to incorporate a limited kind of workshop process to consider, um, consider a vision statement with public input that uh, uh, would also be consistent with the cap as um, we're preparing it and maybe not have that all approved at the next city council meeting, but shortly thereafter. I would support that, Mr. Mayor. I think vision statements are much harder than we may realize they are. So I, I, I was more supportive of what you initially proposed, Kevin, which is to, um, to adopt these suggestions as discussed, bring it back at the next council meeting, and then engage in a separate vision and resolution, emergency resolution process. But Dan looks like he wants to, Schwartz looks like he wants to speak to that. Well, uh, a couple of things to directly answer the mayor. I'm gonna to try to, I'll restate what I said before. The city is not gonna do anything business-wise in the next fiscal year that isn't already contemplated in the existing cap and consistent with the draft cap. So, you know, for example, you had a speaker say we needed a budget to buy electric vehicles, but we already electrified everything for which there are commercially available electric vehicles. So, you know, that sort of stuff's all been done. I, and I really don't, I think if you adopt the cap today, tomorrow, or six months from now, no effect will occur for city business because we're already following all of this. So that's issue one. I, I don't think there's an urgency where we have to adopt it tonight. Um, I wholeheartedly agree with Councilmember Way though that visioning is not an easy exercise. I mean, we first don't need, first we have to define the document's purpose and who owns it and what the vision statement's for. The council should recall we often hire consultants to actually get us through a vision statement process because it's not a simple process. Um, as an alternative, the council may want to consider that to keep our cap consistent with the majority of the caps, we don't have a vision statement rest in the document. But instead, if the council, perhaps in taking up the concept of a climate emergency resolution, also wanted to take up whether the council wanted to make a statement on behalf of the city about its vision for improving the climate, maybe that's a different exercise that has no constraint on the cap whatsoever. That's actually kind of the thought that I had that the, the, the vision plan could be addressed within the framework of the process that we would be moving forward on the resolution and we could get on with the cap. That was kind of what I was thinking when I made that suggestion at the, at the outset. I agree with that. Am I hearing that two of the council members and maybe the city manager kind of know what's going to come out of the public engagement related to a vision statement? 
after we adopt the calf? I don't think so. Uh, I had not suggested that at all, Mr. Vice Mayor. What I'm suggesting is that um, the to draft a vision statement requires that we all have to agree about the purpose of the document. And I think that alone is going to be an interesting discussion because as I understand the CAP, it's a document primarily to guide city operations and policy and procedures. And uh, that what that contemplates in terms of a vision statement for the document versus a vision statement for the city for a whole host of issues that they're different exercises in my opinion i'm suggesting that it, unless you have the discussion about a vision statement related to the cap before you adopt the cap you're going to have a vision statement after adoption of the cap that will be in reaction to the cap and it'll be a very different conversation um i i think we're not in sync mr vice mayor and i don't know that would be constructive but i I'm suggesting that I don't think the cap needs a vision statement and that the council should spend some time deciding what it's making a vision statement about. I agree with that if we adopt the cap tonight without a vision statement. Okay, well, that sounds like that's doable. I think that's consistent with what we were just contemplating a moment ago. We should be go ahead. Get, but I, get, I am. Get some... I am. I just want to be clear. I am in support of creating a, a vision statement in support of the cap as drafted. Yeah, I, under, Not, I understand I, that. I understand that. And we can have a process that allows that to happen. I don't see that there's. I don't think. I don't really see that there's a problem with that. Wait, but just to clarify, I just need to clarify what you mean by that because the draft, the the cap as drafted now is not the cap that we've been discussing adding the additional material that we uh, talked about earlier in the meeting. It I'm including the, the revisions we've discussed tonight as direction. Yeah. And just to, to have it come back to, an, to the next city council meeting, just on the cap and the revisions to the cap, setting aside for the moment, the vision statement, um, just so we can see what the document looks like, but you know, before we sign off on it. Um, at the next city council meeting. And then we'll go through a process where, and I really actually liked um, our city manager's suggestion to you know, consider um, uh, 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 incorporating something like a vision statement within a resolution that would be considered and adopted separately from the cap provisions. If that's, right, the, if that's the consensus, I'm in support of it. Okay, that's I'm in agreement with that also. Thank you for um, uh, doing a synopsis like that. Okay, is that any any thoughts from uh, staff about whether that's workable or not? Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly think we can have the revised cap revisions back, the ones we've listed to you for the for your next meeting second meeting in July without any trouble there. Okay, and we can do that. And then we can have a, um, some thought given during that period of time to um, how we would address the issue of a vision statement, um, right. whether it should be done separately or as I would prefer in following the suggestion of our city manager to incorporate um, something along those lines within the scope of a resolution. I have a question, uh, Dan Schwartz. It, you mentioned Fairfax is the only one that you've seen of a vision statement in Marin. Are there others that we know of? Outside of Marin? I, I don't know. Okay. Okay. Okay, so I think we have a, a suggestion on how to proceed. And I think I heard that um, our vice mayor was prepared to go along with that. Without putting words in his mouth. Uh, I support your suggestion, Mr. Mayor. Okay. So does that provide staff with sufficient direction about our next steps? Yes, I think we'll bring the cap back with the revision and we will bring back a proposal on how to move forward with an engagement to craft some sort of vision statement for the city. Okay. And the cap revisions should be hopefully pretty straightforward and adopted without much fuss, I hope. So I don't think then we need to uh, 
to have a vote on anything tonight. Is that right? That's right. You, you can, uh, we can take this as direction. Um, I guess I do, should ask the city attorney, since we noticed this is a public hearing, do we need to make some sort of specific statement about continuing the hearing? Yeah. I just include a statement that you're continuing it to, if you're, if you know that it's going to be on, what is that, the July, July 21st, 21st, I think. I thought yeah. I heard continuing the hearing 21st. to July 21st. So would that just, that would that just be the motion? Yeah. Um, just to continue the hearing on the cap until July, the next city council meeting on July 21st. With the direction to staff that's given. Yes. That, I think that that is that is the motion. So does somebody want to make that motion? So moved. Second. I guess that's me. Well, could be you. It's up to you. Yes. All right. Member Way. Yes. Vice Mayor Helmer. Yes. Mayor Harrell. Yes. Okay. And Kevin, can I uh, just close this with a comment that um, I really appreciate all the work that the Larkspur uh, get what you uh, climate action group has done. And now I know many of them are still in the audience that will look forward to working with you all on a vision statement. Thank you. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll echo those comments and, and um, uh, very much appreciate um, the leadership shown within the climate group and the efforts. And um, uh, I think we're actually making pretty good progress on getting this done. And we need to get the cap in place. So I think we have a mechanism for doing that. Um, so thank you all for your participation on this and, and input and feedback. And we will, uh, we will move on to the next uh, item. Um, that would be item number eight, which is uh, business items. And I think we have a couple. The first one is 8.1 termination date for temporary parklets authorized under COVID-19 emergency encroachment permits. Um, so with that, can we have a staff report? Yes, good evening, Mayor Haroff, members of council, members of the public, Julian Skinner, I'm the public works director for the city of Larkspur. Um, so the item we have for you tonight is uh, for you to give direction to staff um, on an end date for the temporary parklets um, that are in the downtown. Um, this is a follow up to our special council meeting on May 24th, uh, where we had a conversation about parklets, both the temporary parklets um, and a vision for parklets in the downtown in the future. And as part of that conversation, it was determined that the first course of action should be uh, to come back um, and discuss uh, an end date for the temporary parklets. So uh, that's the item before you tonight. Um, we're certainly um, available to have a, a future conversation about what parklets may look like post COVID, but uh, the item tonight is specifically to determine an end date for the uh, temporary parklets. Um, and so as we discussed at the May 24th meeting, we have um, issued eight permits, eight temporary permits under the uh, emergency COVID um, resolution uh, for businesses uh, to expand their operations into the public right of way. And this was to provide them flexibility in their operations in response to some of the um, COVID uh, related restrictions, mainly on indoor um, operations. And so um, of those eight permits, uh, four of those uh, permittees elected to construct parklets um, in the right of way. Um, so again, for those that weren't with us on the 24th, uh, the parklets, uh, when we say parklets, we're talking about uh, facilities that are constructed basically in public parking spaces that are for um, operations other than public parking. And so uh, the four that we have in, in Larkspur are all uh, used as outdoor uh, dining areas. Um, and so initially these permits were all issued on a temporary basis. They were issued without fee. Um, they were issued um, for a six month duration uh, that lasted through October of last year. And then as we went through the uh, COVID world and realized that we were uh, still dealing with uh, restrictions, uh, those permits were all extended through June 30th um, of this year. Um, and so as we've um, had our conversations with um, the public at a couple of workshops and at the city council meeting on the 24th, um, we've heard um, some public comments, both pro and con uh, for the parklets. Obviously, most of the uh, 
most of the responses for uh, persons that uh, would like the parklets removed are related to uh, the loss of parking that goes along with installing a parklet. Um, and then most of the pro park uh, parklet comments have come from folks that have enjoyed the outdoor uh, dining experience uh, that they afford. Um, and so at this time, uh, we're looking at trying to determine uh, what an end date should be for these temporary encroachments. As I mentioned, um, they're all currently set to expire on June 30th of this year. Um, as we've mentioned before, there is a substantial um, capital improvement project that's scheduled for the downtown area um, early next year. Um, so um, we have been looking at the opportunity to extend um, the temporary parklets um, for some time based on the request from the permittees, uh, but we would not extend any of those temporary encroachments uh, beyond December 31st of this year. Uh, because those encroachments would have to be removed uh, to allow for um, the public project that's scheduled for uh, Magnolia. Um, so I believe you're aware that we've received a number of public comments uh, in advance of, of the meeting from, um, from our residents, both pro and, and con um, the parklets. And so uh, we're looking for uh, council's direction tonight on setting um, a date certain uh, when the temporary parklets uh, would have to be uh, removed. Um, and so with that, um, I'm available for any questions and um, allowing the public an opportunity to comment on this also. I have a question, Dan Hilmer here, Mr. Mayor. Uh, Julian, what is, what are the, uh, what's the upside to, um, for the city if we do not extend the permits past say August or September, or I'm sorry, uh, if, we, if, if the city, that's one way of putting it. What's the downside to the city if we extend this through December 31st? Through or two? Uh, as he described, I, I thought he said two. Yeah, no later than. So the down, there, there would not be any downside as far as city operations go. I believe there has been some concern from the public about the, the lack of parking um, that is offset by, by the parklets. So that's the downside to allowing the parklets to stay as they are is that some members of the community have expressed um, that they would prefer that there were parking spaces there available to them rather than, um, rather than the parklets. As far as city operations go, it's, it, will not, it will not have any impact on the project next year. Uh, a quick follow-up, that parking uh, would be most appreciated during the, probably during the holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, uh, if, my, if my perception is correct. So there, there's a balancing here between um, is the parking more important than the outdoor dining? Uh, and when would that, if, if there is a time, when would that uh, higher priority become more apparent? It seems to me like during the Christmas holidays and shopping, especially if we're allowing uh, indoor, uh, more indoor activity under uh, the reopening. Would, would that perception be reasonable? I think that's the issue that's 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 before us, right? Uh, Council Member Way, it looks like you're you're chomping at the bit there. So, uh, just to clarify, essentially, you are looking for a date, not a design idea, not whether we are going to um, uh, allow certain construction uh, techniques or anything like that for the existing uh parklets that are there right now and we don't have any additional ones planned at this point yeah so that was the consensus of the conversation at the 24th right. uh meeting um was that we should first tackle an end date for the temporary installations and we could at a later date um if the council so chose um have further conversations on um, the future of parklets in, in Larkspur after the temporary permits expire. 
And the street modifications um, and construction is uh, tentatively scheduled for the beginning of next year. Does that mean January or does that mean April or do we really have a firm idea at this point? Um, our best estimate at this time is uh, January through March um, of next year. We've reached out to the business community and we will continue to do so to um, strategize a, a best time of year that would have the least impact on them. Um, it's not necessarily the best time for construction due to uh, weather, um, but we feel that if we can um, get in, in in January and to finish by uh, March, um, it would be the least impact um, overall. Okay. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that we have an abundant amount of public comment through letters which are overwhelmingly supportive of the parklet um, remaining at least temporarily. So. Okay. Yep. I think we've we've seen all seen all those letters. Um, anything else from the council? Um, not at this time. I'd like to hear if there's anybody in the audience who wants to contribute to that. Uh, but I, I did want to quickly respond to uh, the vice mayor's question. I think I maybe not. I didn't provide a direct answer, but the uh, the two dates that we have listed, the June 30th is the current date that's in the permits. The December 31st is what we would see as a no later than, uh, right. but there is obviously opportunity to pick a date that's somewhere in between those two dates if the, if the council so chose. I don't want to limit it to those to those two dates. And uh, just just for clarification, do we have any, any data or information about, because I think the vice mayor's comments were very uh, on point, um, when we would start seeing um, shifts in the demand for parking to accommodate holiday shopping? When does that usually start? Around Thanksgiving? Earlier? So I can't say for here, I don't have access to any studies, but I know from doing similar projects and neighboring agencies um, that the no touch time for removing parking in the downtown was basically the week of Thanksgiving through Christmas. Um, was kind of the, the busy time for when they wanted no impacts to parking. Yeah, I was I was going to suggest that we ask for the public when they make comments to give us feedback on what a November uh, date would look like for reprioritizing parking for the holidays. And that and that would be a date by which the parklets would have to be removed. Yes. Not, not when work on removal would start. Yeah, some, That's when they'd have like to be removed. Somewhere in the, in the beginning, mid-November. Yeah, okay. Okay, anything else from the council before we open it up to the public? Uh, seeing nothing, uh, Allison, we'll turn you over to marshal the public comment through. Our first comment is from Frank Callazo. Frank, go ahead. How are you, Mr. Mayor? Can you hear me? Yes. Great. And can um, I just so, ask, every, to, before we get started, because we do have a lot of uh, folks who are in, uh, potentially in the queue, I'm going to ask everybody who wants to make a, a verbal presentation tonight to begin by stating your name, where you live, and I will be running a timer to keep everything to below three minutes. So with that, you're, you're off. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm Frank Cazzo. I've been the general manager of um, the Left Bank in downtown Larkspur for over five years now. Um, we've been on the front lines, obviously, through COVID, and my only concern in listening to the council discuss this is that um, you're talking about parking and the pleasure of dining, and I haven't really heard anything about safety and a safety plan. Um, I mean, today was the first day that, or yesterday was the first day that things somewhat went back to normal, and I definitely believe by no means that we're out of the woods yet. And for someone who works with in, in the public um, and who's seen the impact that it has firsthand, I think we should really be planning on a possible um, resurgence, um, if not other shutdowns in the future, which would then have us rebuilding parklets and possibly taking them down again. Um, on the left bank's behalf, I'd like to speak in the sense of just somehow being able to get the council to consider separating the left bank ward street parklet um from the magnolia street parklets um we just don't happen to be on the main drag there and our parklet definitely stands out in the sense of the money we've put into it and how we've tried to make it a tribute to the town as well 
So I'm just hoping in some way the council might be able to look at us separately than the Magnolia Street parklets. And then lastly, I just want to say that the parklet does take up three parking spots and it holds about 45 people. And those 45 people would be additional people coming to Larkspur to shop over the holiday seasons. So having the additional seating with the restaurants that actually do bring the majority of outsiders to Larkspur over the holidays would bring more shoppers to, um, to, to downtown Larkspur to perhaps spend money at those other stores. I know that we've won um, best outdoor dining in Marin County from the Pacific Sun and the IJ due to the parklet. So the rest of the county has seen it and it has helped us win rewards um, in, in county publications. So um, I tried to keep it short and go quick. Um, my three points definitely are um, COVID and it's still not really being safe to considering when to remove these. Um, number two, Ward Street compared to Magnolia. And then it really is limited spots. There are only three parking spots each. So it's about 12 total parking spots in Larkspur. Thank you for your time. Much appreciated. Um, thank you all for everything you do. And thank you, Frank. We appreciate your, your contribution tonight. Mr. Mayor, um, may, I, may I make a comment quickly? Yes, I, please. I, I, I also want to give credit to the left bank for the fine job they've done with their improvement and their parklet. But that's a very different discussion than what we're having right now. And tonight, right now we're focusing on an end date where the temporary permits should expire. Any discussions rela related to the use of the public right of way by private uh, businesses is a real, real estate discussion that will have to take place after we decide uh, on the date where the temporary permits end. Those real estate discussions are gonna be more complicated than just um, whether we like what's going on or not. There, have to, there has to be some due diligence conducted on behalf of the city as to how to manage the, the asset, which is the public right of way. So that's a very different conversation than just appreciating what's going on in the parklets right now. Tonight, we're focused on deciding a date where the temporary condition needs to end. And I think we should stay focused on that. And I would appreciate it if, if the public comment would focus on that. I think emotionally, we're all very supportive of all the merchants and, and how we have gotten through the pandemic. I'm very grateful and appreciative for all the work and all the effort. But the real estate discussion about what to do after the temporary date is decided is very different. So I think we just need to focus on this tonight and take things one step at a time. Uh, and, and thank you, uh, Vice Mayor. I think those are all points uh, well taken and consistent with um, what's on the agenda for tonight. So with that, um, uh, we'll move on to our next speaker. And again, please state, please state your name, where you live, and keep it to under three minutes, thanks. And I'm sorry, Andrew. Yeah, go ahead, Louise. Hi, this is Elise Simonian from Magnolia Avenue. So I live really near downtown. And um, based on those comments that um, the council just made, I just, I'll make this brief. Um, I, I really love the outdoor uses and I would encourage them to continue as much as you can allow them to. And maybe if they have to go away, maybe they could be temporarily allowed again next year. Um, but I also would love to hear what, um, or would like you to give a lot of weight to what the merchants say about them because um, they're, they're hurting too. And I know the restaurants have, have really benefited from these, but I would love um, our merchants to survive downtown too. So thank you very much for considering them. I really, I really love them. Good, thank, thank you for that contribution. Um, who's next? We received an emailed public comment that I'll read aloud now. It comes from David Muller. He writes, Dear Larkspur City Council and staff, I'm a little unclear on staff's recommendation regarding the parklets on Magnolia in downtown Larkspur. Quote, Staff proposes extending the non-parklet temporary permits that have been issued for outdoor dining through December 31st, 2021, end quote. Non-parklet, uh, question mark. I strongly favor extending the permits for the existing parklets and on-sidewalk dining. It's helping the restaurants recover from the pandemic and it's made Larkspur a lively and pedestrian friendly place. It's like being in Europe. We need to make sure public safety and ADA concerns are addressed but I say let's keep the parklets and on sidewalk dining 
at least through fall from David Mahler in Larkspur. And I see we have a raised hand again, uh, caller ending in 1402. Okay, state your name, please. Uh, James Holmes, Larkspur. <clears throat> I suspect that the bloom may be off the rows of the uh, private eating areas uh, once we fully open up. On the other hand, as was pointed out, uh, if the, we have uh, a COVID resurgence, then they will probably become more popular. Uh, but uh, I suspect that eating next to a busy street has ultimately limited allure. I call it uh, cuisine a la carbon monoxide. Uh, but um, uh, one of the features of uh, I, I previously gave the council a list of 11 reasons uh, why not to make the uh, parklets a permanent. And uh, one of those reasons was seasonal use. Uh, I, I predict that uh, the uh, popularity will diminish tremendously uh, once we get cold and and maybe even rain and so this uh, focuses this this focuses in with the what the vice mayor said that uh, uh, perhaps uh, they should be uh, uh, phased out um, by by uh, some date in November or perhaps perhaps Halloween or right after Halloween or by November the 15th I had initially thought perhaps continue them to the end of the year uh, and again, I think to a certain extent, we have to keep our uh, minds open with respect to what the COVID situation is um, at, at the by Halloween. I hope we don't get uh, that trick or treat. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that uh, the issue really is whether we allow it to go into Thanksgiving or, and, and Christmas. I would one other thing I would say, I haven't heard much from from the merchant speaking out. Uh, but uh, several merchants have said to me that they uh, did not want the parklets, non-restaurant parklets, that they did not want them to continue, that they con considered it favoritism to the extent that it extends beyond the time of exigency for the restaurants. And I'm not quite sure I understand their reticence, but they all, so many of them asked for copies of my material, and, and they, I, I didn't specifically ask to speak on their behalf, but uh, there does seem to be a concern uh, by the merchants, which for one reason or another, uh, may not be uh, expressed. So in any event, it would seem to me that uh, it would be reasonable to uh, uh, terminate them either perhaps November 15th uh, or uh, barring COVID resurgence or uh, by, by year end. Thank you. Thank you, James. Who's next in the queue? Something for any raised hand or any email public comment. And there's no further public comment. Oh. Okay. Well, in that case, we'll bring it back to the council. And again, um, I think the issue before us is consideration and um, providing guidance um, uh, on adoption of the recommendation for a date certain to um, uh, terminate the emergency COVID-19 encroachment permits. Uh, with recommendation that that date be set no later than December 31st, 2021. So with that, uh, any further comments um, uh, from council, including uh, as appropriate suggestions, if we're going to go this route, um, uh, what would be the best date? And I see, I think, I, th I think council member Way had her hand up a little bit first. So go ahead. Okay, so first question I have for Julian is, could you speak to the separation of Ward versus Magnolia for the parking, for the, not the parking, for the pavement rehabilitation plan? Does that include Ward Street? No, the Magnolia project uh, will go from Ward to King and it will only be on uh, Magnolia. It will extend a little bit into the side streets, but it wouldn't actually uh, touch the left banks parklet, um, okay. but it is in such close proximity to what will be a pretty significant construction project that it's very likely that with some of the traffic controls and the detouring um, that that uh, parklet could conflict with the upcoming work. Um, it should also be noted that the Pico parklet is also just outside the footprint of the Magnolia project but it too is close enough to that project that I think it would have an impact 
on completing that project uh, successfully if it were to remain in place. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, so I'll put out my thoughts about this. Um, I've spent a lot of time in the downtown corridor actually meeting with people who are property owners there. And there's a, appears to be so much support for keeping the parklets, at least for a temporary business, a temporary time. And I can refer everyone to Bill Howard's email that he sent on Sunday, June 6, where he uh, is also a downtown property owner who expressed uh, uh, asking us to keep the parklets in place until the paving project is ready to start. So all, 90% of the emails that came in and 90% of the comments were about keeping the parklets. Um, I think it's uh, the staff's uh, suggestion that until the end of December, the 31st makes the most reasonable sense to me um, to extend the permit to that period of time. I understand uh, Vice Mayor Hilmer's concerns about uh, parking for shopping, but that's the trade-off that we have with an additional number of, of people um, coming to town to dine um, means that we have additional people who could also be shopping. I don't think parking is really should be the death knell to the parklets at this period of time until we're fully through with the COVID restrictions. So my um, opinion is to adopt this, the, uh, the staff re uh, report and suggestion to extend the permits till the 31st of December. I would also consider us revisiting them in the fall um, should we uh, see that they are becoming um, uh, more difficult in the safety concerns. I think Frank's comment about safety for the uh, consumer and the need for many people still not being comfortable dining inside um, is still something that we will exist through the fall and probably until the beginning of next year. So that's and, my thoughts. And, and just to clarify, the staff recommendation is not to select December 31st. It's, it's to select the date no later than December 31st. Right, and I would like to December 31st to be where the permits are extended to. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. I don't want to mischaracterize what the recommendation is. Um, uh, any, any, so we don't have anybody else from the public. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Hilmer. Um, I would like to suggest uh, no later than November 15th. I'd like to create a little window of space between uh, the time where we're terminating these permits and the end of the year, as well as the paving project so that the downtown merchants have a chance to uh, regain some of the, the parking and uh, front frontage uh, visibility that they've had for the, the holidays. And I'm not sure that the, the diners um, or the weather is going to be uh, optimal for outdoor stuff through the holidays. I just think that uh, Terminating the permits no later than November 15th um, provides the most opportunity for the most merchants and doesn't favor a few over the many, especially in a reopening situation. I understand the comments about risk of a resurgence, and I'm willing to take that risk uh, because I think things are moving in a direction, uh, an opening direction, and I I think we're going to uh, need to support the merchants, all the merchants, uh, as we get into this holiday season. So uh, can I ask you why you don't think they're being supported? I mean, we've had two discussions on this. We had it in May 24th, and we also, they got notice from the city twice. And now we have a second meeting out of it, and not a single merchant has, to, has presented themselves to be concerned about this affecting their business. Well, there's not a single letter or an email or a public comment from a merchant that's outlining. Well, I, I would expect anybody that's been given a free gift of real estate for a year and a half, you're not going to hear from them uh, because it's a gift. No, those but, are the rest. And all the, and all the other merchants who don't have the opportunity are not going to complain because should they have the opportunity to get free real estate for a year and a half, they'd take it too. I just think that most of the storefronts in the downtown, you can't see them. And I think, getting the downtown back to some sort of uh, character that uh, is supportive of the district, I think is helpful. And I don't think this will take away anything from the, those that have parked, which they've benefited 
uh, unusually from this. And I, I'm glad to have provided the support, but we told everybody it was temporary. And I think that we need to set the temporary date so that the, the opportunity for, again, for the most merchants during the holidays is, is, uh, is there. And then we need to talk about the real estate issues following, uh, should we want to continue this or not? Because those are, it's a very different conversation than we've had to date. Well, I, I would put forward that the benefit to the parklets is much more than just to the um, restaurant owners. It's really become a community gathering space in many ways. And if you spend time in any of the restaurants or spend time in any of the coffee house and a Ruli's coffee house, you'll see that it's become um, really an extension of uh, community center conversation and people from all over being there. So I, I see it as a benefit for the merchants as well as the restaurateurs um, because it brings a lot more people into that public space there. In my experience, having uh, attended many of, of uh, a public uh, coffee and lunch and at some of these parklets, they're very engaging places for community conversations. So I'm in favor of keeping them at least till the end of the year. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna uh, ask for a motion here in a minute, but I, I wanna just offer some observation um, as well. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that perceptions about um, the utilization and, and, and benefits of the parklets has really been formed during a period of time when they were permitted on a temporary basis to accommodate societal changes uh, driven by the pandemic, um, which are now kind of going away. So I don't know whether the experience that we've had um, um, prior to the terminate or to the, the, the ending wrapping up of the pandemic is really necessarily much of guidance in terms of what's gonna happen in the future. And I, my own view is that uh, I think the December 15th date um, constitutes a reasonable compromise of the different interests that may be at, at play here. Um, so that would be my, my inclination. Mr. Mayor, do you mean November 15th? I'm sorry, did I misspeak? I meant November 15th, yeah. So with that, um, I think we've fleshed out the issues here. Unless someone disagrees, I'd entertain a motion. My concern with this is that this is a big, in many ways, a decision that I'm feeling hesitant that only three of us here have not, do not speak to the full volume of the five member council. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, we do have a quorum, but uh, I'm listening to what was presented on May 24th I think the conversation was very different with um, a full council than it is with three. Well, let's see how it goes. I'll move that November 15th is the end of the temporary permit date for parklets. Um, and I'll second that motion. Council member Way? No. Council, excuse me, Vice Mayor Hilmer? Yes. Mayor Harrell. Yes. So I think that motion is now approved. <clears throat> and that will conclude the end of this agenda item. I think there's still a law in the books that we're supposed to make oh. uh, clear who voted no. I think oh. that we're supposed to repeat. So for the record, Council Member Way voted no in okay. the past two to one. Sorry for that. Um, that's okay. okay. I just, that's that's that, in the back of my head. The record is now clear. So thank you for that. Um, so this, just a clarification on that then, um, Dan Schwartz, does uh, notification now go out to the merchants that their temporary permits will be revoked on November 15th? And will they have to have the structures entirely removed on November 15th? So I, I believe with Julian answered this question, he would tell you he has to issue them amended permits anyway, because most of them have June 30 expiration dates. So they'll get new permits that extend out to November 15 and will include the condition uh, and direction about removing uh, their material from the right of way. And if there are community uh, uh, members who would like to further discuss this, is what opportunity do they have to bring this back to the council? Well, I think I'd want to frame that carefully for the community because 
what you'd be framing for the community is do you want to have the parklets for one more month because then they got they do need to go because we need them out of the way for our project i think a different question for the public might be when does the public want to have a discussion about permanent parklets whether we frame that uh, as a, a real estate transaction as the vice mayor suggested or not I think that might be a good question for the public is how can they ask for that conversation to occur? And I think by continuing to contact the five of you through the city clerk or individually, they can express their views on, on the future of Parkland after the, after Magnolia receives its rehabilitation and ADA improvements. All right, thank you for that. Okay, any other questions? Comments? Um, seeing I none. I voted on, but can I ask why November 15th? That's a Monday. Why was that the date put forward? Was it just an arbitrary date? Or is there a specific November 15th being a specific time? Would you like it to be November 12th? No, I'd like it to be December 31st, but I was outvoted. Well, I know you would, but you were outvoted. I know. I'm just asking why November. So it's November 15th. So you don't want to ask me answer why a Monday, November 15th was a chosen date. I just wondering for the merchants because it is a Monday. Um, it is a work day Monday. So wondering. Uh, it, if it, it means they probably have the weekend to uh, achieve their compliance. I'm guessing that the way this will end up playing out uh, is that we'll essentially tell them to begin deconstruction on November 15th. Um, so I, Monday's not really a terrible day from that standpoint because it means the staff will be present through the week to make sure that that's done in an efficient and safe manner. Okay, thank I you. Know, I don't know if that was the vice mayor's thinking, but uh, Monday does have some advantages for staff in terms of managing the situation. Actually, what I was thinking was if we want to keep discussing this, one of the two council members who voted in the affirmative would have to ask the city manager to agendize it. To agendize what, a change? Yes. Um, I'm, 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 I'm comfortable with the way it is, frankly. So, am I. so I'm, not, I'm not inclined to do that. Nor am I. OK, are we done with this item? Uh, let's move on to item 8.2, which is um, uh, possible preparation and submission of an appeal to the Association of Bay Area Governments and the MTC uh, regarding the six uh, uh, RENA uh, cycle um, recommendation or allocation. Um, and this is an interesting one for me and I'd appreciate a staff report on it. Neil, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. You're muted. Neil, by phone, you'll want to hit star nine to unmute yourself. Okay, well, I'll, Neil will try to try to do this. I'll, <laughs> I'll take a crack at the staff report. Um, the Association of Bay Area Government has uh, uh, published the regional housing needs allocations for the sixth cycle. Um, we're now in the period where agencies have the option to consider filing an appeal. Uh, the way ABAG has set this up is the uh, filed appeal is actually through a form on their website. So we, rather than draft a letter, we're seeking direction tonight to complete the form. Um, and I think that um, where Mr. Toff able to speak to us, he would probably be uh, highlighting some of the numbers that are found in the material you have in terms of uh, what our arena situation looks like. Um, and as folks who've been following our discussions recently are aware and may have seen in the staff report, 
uh, Larkspur is receiving a fairly substantial increase in um, the expectation of housing units that will be planned for. Uh, and it's going to be very challenging. One of the concerns that staff has uh, outlined and the uh, council has. Oop, there he is. Neil, you're back. <laughs> okay. Uh, Neil, let me finish this statement and then I'll turn it over to you. Um, and that was simply that um, we think that this number being what it is and looking at the topography layout and opportunities in Larkspur, there's a lot of pressure being created by this arena number for us to plan for intensification of development uh, in areas that are higher fire risk oh, and sorry, areas yeah. that are also um, uh, toward the floodplain uh, and neither of those are ideal. So um, that's our concern and basis by which we might encourage the council to, to direct us to file an appeal. ID followed by town. <laughs> Neil, no, I can you hear you. We can hear you. You can stop. have entered the meeting as a panelist. Attendees can we, now we hear, hear you speak. This meeting is being recorded. Okay. Say something, maybe Neil. He, maybe he can't I hear think you. I'm in. Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. I'm in. Okay. So Dan, you took care of everything? Uh, unless you had any presentation to make. Um, I'll, I'll try to pick up, make a quick presentation. Um, as the council is probably already aware, uh, due to housing legislation over the last several years and the demographic projections, uh, Department of Housing Communities and Development has prescribed uh, 441,176 units for Bay Area Council governments uh, over our next arena planning cycle. That's from 2023 to 2031 um, this is a significant number an increase over the past cycles. But it's a number that's shared amongst all the Bay Area jurisdictions. Um, as we've discussed, not just is this a larger number, but the methodology that was adopted through the methodology committee also shifts a slightly larger number portion to uh, suburban and rural communities, particularly suburban communities than the prior cycle. Uh, this is due to focusing on inclusion of equity criteria and high resource areas for health and education standards. Um, additionally, like Marin, many smaller suburban communities throughout the Bay Area face similar increases. Uh, our methodology also skews more to more units in areas containing transit stations like the smart station and the ferry landing. These are sources for combining commute and reducing VMT for housing. Uh, the council has previously commented on the methodology proposed by the committee um, twice in October and then in November. At the time, the council recommended uh, ABAG utilize the plan Bay Area household growth as the baseline for the methodology um, as opposed to um, just households. And this is a methodology that actually is, makes practical sense and is certainly a reasonable application and would result in some reduction to um, suburban communities like Larkspur. However, uh, the ABAG Executive Committee moved forward with the proposed arena methodology with households um, uh, and Subsequently, they send that methodology to HCD to confirm, or HCD may challenge that methodology. Um, HCD did confirm that the proposed RENA methodology approved by ABAG met the statutory requirements. So um, the final methodology was approved May 20th. Uh, it did slightly decrease our RENA from the initial methodology there were some tweaks. Uh, as a result, our final arena is 979 total units. 291 of those are very low income, 168 are moderate income, and 145 would be, excuse me, 168 are low income, 145 would be moderate income. These are pretty 
part large numbers for affordable housing relative to only 375 market rate units. So it's the level of affordability that presents pretty significant challenge. With the release of the draft of these approved RENA, jurisdictions in the Bay Area are now eligible to file an official appeal with RENA on the RENA numbers. And they are filed with ABAG and MTC. They're not filed to the state or HCD. Um, MTC and ABAG are the governmental body. They hold hearings on appeals and decide whether to deny, uphold, or partially uphold an appeal application. Uh, applications for appeals have to be made on specific criteria established by state law and must be filed to ABAG and MTC by July 9th. And they're done on a, um, they're done actually through online forms. And so there's sort of a prescribed process for doing that. And they're also a prescribed grounds for appeal. Um, so it's not necessarily the same venue as the con comment letter. Um, you really have to follow certain stretch statutory grounds. Um, and while we could have filed an appeal, um, there are various factors to be considered in doing so. There would be some resources required to present a really credible appeal. Um, and that could be significant. We haven't, we've just started kind of that exercise um, based on the grounds to review what that appeal would be. And I know all the other jurisdictions throughout Marin are considering these. Um, in reviewing appeals from recently uh, submitted appeals through Southern California Association of Go Governments, um, they can range from simple letters to thoroughly reviewed, reviewed documents and, and uh, reports. And I provided a link to some appeals there. Um, for any redistribution of RENA numbers, uh, the 441,000 units still apply across the Bay Area. So any reduction to one agency's uh, RENA requires it's redistributed amongst other jurisdictions and cities rather than eliminated from the overall RENA for the Bay Area. As many other area jur jurisdictions have other environmental constraints similar to Larkspur, this may decrease the likelihood that an appeal would be upheld. Um, <clears throat> and we note the appeal process is different for each region. Uh, it's ABAG that would be reviewing the appeal here, not necessarily the Council of Governments in Southern California or um, uh, San Diego area. Um, of three appeals filed with ABAG in 2013, uh, three of eight were upheld, um, and that was in the fifth cycle element, but there were only eight appeals filed out of all the jurisdictions. Um, <clears throat> more recently, only two of the 48 appeals filed <clears throat> by the Southern California uh, Los Angeles region were partially upheld in their more recent cycle in this current cycle. They follow a uh, two-year cycle behind ours or ahead of ours. Now, I've attached a slide um, slide deck from ABAG that explains the RENA process and the appeal process, and there's some information on the appeals there. I could bring that up. Um, again, a jurisdiction or HCD may appeal any other agency's RENA, but such other jurisdictions or HCD could potentially appeal Larkspur's RENA or another RENA. So this is kind of a new twist that's been added uh, to the legislation, um, but it is very focused on agencies appealing uh, as opposed to out, um, other parties, um, non-governmental parties. Uh, we know that the Town Council of Corte Madera directed their staff to file an appeal. They're looking at doing that on grounds of uh, challenges relative to sea level rise and environmental constraints of sea level rise in blue zones. Um, we have not, we know other jurisdictions are considering this at this time where all the jurisdictions are, are kind of in a mode of do we appeal or not. I think we're looking at a mix. Um, the anticipation is that the reality is it's a, it's a big number. It's a big number all around. And um, there may be a lot of appeals 
but it's going to be difficult to uphold uh, or move um, move units uh, across jurisdictions because they're all uh, pretty, you know, pretty significantly impacted. Um, the uh, and the appeal is cannot really be challenged on the methodology itself. It has to be based on new um, new factors, new considerations, um, a variety of things. So I, I'll pull up the slide deck here. Um, Allison, can you uh, share my screen? This may help for the discussion. I believe you have um, access to the share screen button at the bottom of your okay. Zoom window. The slide deck's in the in the uh, agenda yeah. packet as well. So, I think we probably can can advance to the council discussion, Neil. Okay. Uh, and just as a final uh, final note, if we do proceed to appeal, um, we would be likely focusing on similar grounds of the environmental constraints, uh, particularly sea level rise, flooding in the areas that are uh, primarily identified for growth through Plan Bay area, as well as the Wui and the hillsides, uh, particularly in those areas around the transit stations. Um, but it is a, a matter we would have to really research to identify you know, the best and strongest grounds for appeal. Okay, anything uh, further from staff? I, I'm starting to see some hands popping up from the council. Uh, council member Way, do you have a question? Thank you, Neil, for that. Um, two questions. I see in attachment 8.2, uh, attachment two, the two page form that they've now required, ABAG is now required that we fill out rather than a letter. How much staff time do you think that that would take to fill that out, um, including the brief description of the appeal request and statement? Um, I think it's it will take it'll certainly take some staff time uh, to prepare. Um, I've begun kind of reviewing that data um, and the uh, the appeal requirements. It's, it's difficult to say. Um, and I think part of it depends on, again, how much we delve into, you know, pursuing or documenting the grounds for the appeal. But uh, I'm going to say it's going to take a, you know, several days to a week of staff time. And we're just having some conversations with consultants and other agencies on how they're uh, pursuing this. Yeah, I'm trying to. I'm trying to balance that with the fact that they have granted very few appeals based on your on the staff report page three, they two out of 48 appeals to the Southern California region. And in 2013, they only did three out of eight appeals. Uh, I'm it may be a futile attempt and whether our appeal will be listened to I'm not confident in, but I, I do think that we may need to continue to push back against these numbers, but I just want to make sure that we're protective of staff time, that if this is going to take you weeks to fill out, and it's unlikely that an appeal will even be listened to by this organization, um, I think we need to weigh that factor. So if it's a, a week of staff time, that's a lot of time. Um, I'm just concerned about and, that. And I think, it, I think it would be a fair statement to, to let the council know. Yeah, I think you'd have to recognize it is going to, to file a reasonably, you know, a reasonably well-versed appeal with Browns. Um, at least uh, it, it's going to certainly take some staff time. So I think it would be good to recognize that. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate also that, as you say, the likelihood will this have an effect it's it seems fairly, fairly unlikely and i think most of the directors and people i've talked to 
approaching this recognize that? And then the question is, do you do you kind of file the appeal to, you know, again push back, make sure your position is heard relative to um, other communities and so on. And there may be another avenue of certainly, rather than filing an appeal, certainly providing a letter to a bag. I, I I just don't know if that's has any effect of sort of defending at least our posi current position. <laughs> well, and and um, I appreciate that because I think we need to defend our our local control. But in my experience in this eight years I've been doing this, ABAG doesn't really seem to care about that. So um, I just want to make sure that we, as council members, recognize how important it is that we protect our staff's, um, the reasonableness request of our staff. So I just wanted to hear from you the complication, how complicated it would be to, to do this. I, I look at this Corte Madera plan and it looks like a, a, a very fancy consultant did it. So I don't know how, I don't know if they did, but uh, I wanna make sure we protect our, uh, our time. So that's my concern, thanks. Yeah. Vice Mayor uh, Helmer, do you have any input here? Uh, Neil, is there a way to capture the um, the areas, geographic areas that would uh, have environmental constraints and consistent with uh, in, uh, development that would be in uh, at higher density levels than what is allowed by our general plan? Is it, is it easy to capture those areas? We talked about hillside areas and flood zone areas without getting into a lot of uh, specific analysis. It's, it would seem to me you could identify those areas very gen uh, simply and generally and not uh, have to get into a great deal of detail. Just identify the areas. And uh, I think the phrase environmental constraints uh, in terms of flood zone and wildland urban interface areas. Um, mean, they, those phrases mean a lot when used as descriptors. So I'm wondering, is, is there a way to do this simply and not uh, with a great deal of complexity? And, and that may that may be the, and I think that would be the most, the basic approach. The most basic approach would be to identify using some of the GIS and the graphics that we have, and the the um, the vulnerability analysis done by the county, the sea level rise vulnerability analysis, and kind of accumulate some just basic background data about those areas um, that are constrained where we do have wooey. Uh, we have a lot of wooey in residential areas, and certainly some of the growth would be anticipated in the single-family residential zones. Um, that's not a, anticipated as being a large portion of the growth, but that's a, that's a piece of it. Um, so you could tell kind of a, a pretty basic story by overlaying that in, in our areas that are anticipated for development. I think the methodology, which kind of winds back to uh, Plan Bay Area and a lot of the studies that were done to create Plan Bay Area, um, it would be it would be difficult to really piece those apart, but we could certainly make a case for the challenges of trying to develop in this area. the The one thing to keep in mind is part of the requirement, the statutory requirement is going to be if you if you've got to up zone and you've got to increase your densities, it's it's not going to be it's not gonna be based on the general plan that currently exists. It's, it's a matter of updating your housing element to, you know, to find the ways to meet the development. And so the approach from HCD is not entirely, you know, it's not entirely tracked with the realities of flood and sea level rise. They're recognizing their plan Bay area is taking into account an assumption of billions of dollars of infrastructure that will be needed over time to eventually manage and deal with sea level rise. The housing is kind of being implemented separate from that, but it, it could be a very basic approach of identifying here are anticipated areas for growth 
and here are the, the constraints within those areas. Part of the appeal, as I understand, is you need to identify kind of by numbers. That's where it gets more difficult. Well, my really suggestion would be to uh, take those same geographical areas and apply current general plan policies to those and make a counter proposal at a general level as to what we would be willing to accept mm -hmm. as a, a counter offer, say, to um, those and explain that this level of development would describe what we would be, would we consider to be sa uh, safe and um, sustainable. Uh, given the given the physical uh, realities of the geography and environmental constraints, kind of give them a sequa. Uh, yeah, and I, uh, th this is Kevin. I I kind of generally um, share the sentiments that our vice mayor just offered up. Um, my my own view is that um, this is a big issue for us, and um, it would almost be a dereliction of our of our duty to our constituents not to uh, preserve our legal rights um, uh, in a prudent way. Um, and I think that probably can be done with um, uh, just a thoughtful approach to structuring the appeal in a way that minimizes uh, staff time and the, you know, the information uh, that may need to be compiled. Obviously, some folks who are pursuing appeals take different you know, approaches towards what they put together in support of their appeal. Um, some, as maybe Court Madeira did, put it together a lot of stuff. Um, we, I think we might want to make sure that um, if we do pursue an appeal and provide that direction, um, that we make sure that we uh, give direction to staff to, um, to uh, ensure that the minimum amount of information and effort is put into it in, in order to assure that we have a defensible uh, uh, document, appeal document. And that would be that would be my uh, my recommendation. Um, I had a couple, just a, other couple quick questions, and these are really more for Sky. Um, you know, again, recognizing the concern that um, these appeals uh, could be time consuming and 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 challenging, um, and recognizing as well that some of the communities, Corbin Dare is a good example of that, will be basing their appeals on similar facts as we might be uh, basing our appeal. Are there, are there opportunities under ABAG's procedures to file joint appeals or to join in appeals filed by another agency and then supplement um, existing appeals with you know, our specific information to our uh, community uh, in order to uh, avoid some additional um, uh, standalone cost? And then I have a follow up question to that, but go ahead on that. So my understanding, just based on the way that ABAG has set up the appeal process, it would be difficult for agencies to jointly file or to join into others um, appeals just because they, they've di dictated a form and a manner of submitting yeah. it that, that basically precludes that. I, I, I'm sure that there are opportunities for communities in Marin who are planning to file appeals to share information um, and to um, look for opportunities to use each other's um, information to construct their own appeals. But I, I, I don't see, a, I, I don't immediately see a manner to either join, do a joint appeal or join one in somebody else's. And, the, and that and that that's probably right, um, just because of the way they've set it up. Um, but still, there uh, I've got to believe that there would be, um, uh, you know, uh, opportunities to take advantage of work being done by other jurisdictions that face the same kinds of challenges that we're facing, to share information and to avoid uh, duplication of effort in terms of, of you know, supporting you know everything we need to support in order to make a legally defensible appeal. So I, 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 I would, I would, I'm, I'm confident that that's true. And um, if we do decide to go this route, that would certainly be direction I'd, I'd want to provide to to staff and their and their efforts. The minimum amount of effort that we have to put in in order to preserve our legal rights, which leads me to the second question, just a follow up question. 
um, when we're talking about an appeal, we're talking about an appeal that is uh, uh, addressed to ABAG and decided by ABAG. Um, uh, and they may accept the appeal, they may not accept the appeal, they may hear it, they may make a decision, but one way or another, it's all with ABAG. Um, uh, uh, depending on what ABAG does, um, is, is that it? Or are there opportunities for judicial review? Of an ABAG, of an ABAG decision on an appeal? Yeah, uh, my understanding, um, subject to verification uh, is that um, there that that there would be an opportunity to file a judicial appeal of this because it is an administrative decision yeah um, so so ultimately you'd be able to um, seek judicial review of that decision okay and in that context there may be opportunities to make additional arguments that wouldn't necessarily be specific to our community because they're maybe not fact-based as much as they're raising legal issues that would be common to multiple jurisdictions and the ability to maybe share um, resources in the context of a judicial proceeding may be greater than it would be in the context of of uh, just the administrative proceeding but you've, you've, you've answered my my question is, is do we have an ability to pursue, if we choose to at a later date, judicial review of this? And your answer is yes. Um, and if we do not pursue an appeal, then our ability to pursue judicial review at a later time is undermined. I, I say that's, that's a fair assessment. Yeah, that, that's correct. You, you, the city would have to exhaust its administrative remedies, which means following this appeal to the AVAC board. Yeah, exactly. So that's that's the only way we can preserve our legal rights. We have to pursue an appeal, um, or we basically don't have the opportunity to join with others if the overall action by ABAG that affects our multiple jurisdictions is subject to a judicial proceeding. So um, I think we can do that. Uh, I think we do that in a cost-effective way, and and um, um, I, that that's that's my inclination. But I think unless there are other council members that want to add anything to this item at this point. Maybe we want to open it up to the public. I do have see our city manager raising, raising his hand. Yeah, I, I'm only offering this point because I've had it raised in meetings I've attended. And I think Neil has heard something similar. I think the general belief is if any agency did get an appeal successfully, uh, or they were successful in their appeal, the housing allocation is not going to leave Marin. It's just going to be assigned to the other Marin agencies. It may make it difficult to collaborate with the other agencies. Fair enough. There's a zero sum structure to the whole thing. Just wanted to make sure you were aware of that. Yeah, that, that's fair enough. And we may not be able to, to pursue a, you know, a holistic strategy in doing that because as you say, it can be a zero sum. Um, but at the same time, if we don't stand up and other entities do pursue an appeal, then we're kind of at the mercy of the outcome of their proceeding. Um, I would worry about that a great deal. Uh, Council Member Way, your hands up. So I, I agree with that, Kevin, I, I, but I would like to make sure we're protective of staff time, because if you look at the, oh, I agree. If you look at the appeal and you click on the development pattern, um, it, uh, we are bright red, which means that we are priority development area. You bet. With the asterisk meaning that that's probably a place that they are not going to budge on because I um, know how ABAG works. But I mean, I'd like us to continue the appeal because I think it's a really important part of how we uh, protect our community and our community spaces. Um, but we're bright red and they're only Sausalito is bright red in in their mapping system. So I think right. that should be a forewarning that um, we're a priority development area for them. And yeah, I'm no, it, 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 that. it's that that's absolutely right. And that's actually, in my mind, another reason to pursue the appeal. Um, and also maybe uh, a mitigating consideration if we are worried about the zero sum game aspect of it, because we are a target, we are getting a disproportionately large allocation um, under this current methodology. And I think it's unfair, um, and it it um, it places an undue burden on our community relative to others in Marin. Right. So 
um, you know, I, I, I want to be sensitive to the interests of other communities, but um, I think this is a situation where we need to stand up for our, our, for our constituency first and foremost. So unless there's other uh, comments from the council, maybe we can see if there's anybody in the public that wants to weigh in. I'm looking for any raised hands from our audience members or any emailed public comment. And there is no public comment. Okay, good. Well, then let's bring it back to the council um, for any further comment and discussion. Um, I guess we need a we need a motion to to proceed or not proceed. So move. Oh well, uh, let's before the before we make that motion. I'm happy to have that have you make that motion. Um, because uh, I, uh, you need to be more clear. Because I was to, whether to, to move or not to move. To proceed, move to proceed. Okay, um, and I can ask for a second, um, unless there's further conversation. I'll, I'll second that. Okay, um, go ahead, and I guess we have a motion to uh, pursue an appeal. Is that correct? Uh, along the lines of the discussion we've had, where yeah. we try to minimize staff time and kind of keep it at a a general level. And with that understanding, is that sufficient direction for staff to go forward? Yes, thank you. I think that's uh, that's helpful. I think some of the comments or the direction from um, Council Member Hilmer are very are very helpful, Vice Mayor Hilmer. So we'll um, uh, go forward. Okay. All right. Well, good. Uh, I'm also happy to help in the future, Neil. Yeah, me too. Okay. And they they take you up on that. I like to read I like to read things that look legal. Um, so uh, so we have a motion uh, and we have a second. I guess we go to a vote. Council member way. Yes. Vice Mayor Helmer. Yes. Mayor Harrell. Yes. So the motion carries. And that's good. Let me see if I can get back to our agenda. And that concludes uh, agenda item number 8.2. We'll move on to 8.3 appointments, not apartments, I'm still thinking about Rena. Appointments to the Larkspur uh, Library Board, uh, Marin County Commission on Aging and Measure B Citizens Oversight Committee. Do we, do we have a staff report for this? I think it's, this may be pretty straightforward. We have, a, we have some candidates that we need to uh, make a decision about. That's correct, Mr. Mayor. It's kind of all in, in your court. Um, you do have one of the positions where there are two candidates for one seat. So uh, other than that, I think you have one candidate for each appointment. So in that, in that one where we have two candidates for one position, that's on the Measure B, correct? That's correct. Okay. Do we need to, to take each one of these separately? Um, I'll say this and then the city attorney can tell me if I'm right or wrong. I think you could package the nominations and uh, approval together for all of for all of them, but uh, you may want to at least park the measure B one separately since you're making a choice and you may that, want to that's kind of that. what I what I yeah that's kind of what I was looking for. So I maybe we can have two two formal motions and one motion would be to to uh, uh, adopt and well, to, to appoint the candidates who have stood up for the library board and Marin County Commission on Aging. So uh, just, Catherine? A, just a question. Uh, we had, since our last meeting and the interviews, we there appears to be an additional resignation from the Measure B uh, board, which allows an additional seat to be open um, after July. So is it possible at this point uh, to appoint two members or do we have to open that up to the public process again? I think the city clerk has told me that we essentially have to follow the Matty Act and, and we do need to open up the oh. seat. I think you could certainly, you're well within bounds to encourage whoever you don't select tonight to reapply, which we could make a very simple process for that person. So. Okay. So we essentially within the next uh, month we'll be appointing two people anyway. That's true. Right. Okay. But but technically, I, I suppose there could be other people who could stand okay. up for that that remaining open position, although That's it seems, seems unlikely. 
Um, okay, well, then, then do we have a motion to approve um, uh, the reappointment of incumbents to the library board and the Commission on Aging? Yes, I will move the uh, uh, reappointment of Jeff Gunderson and Andy Ravel to the library board and uh, Marin County Commission on Aging, Judy Saffron. Do we need those as two separate measures? Or? And we also need to, to move on the appointment of a new member for the library board. But correct? you asked for incumbent at this point. Oh, so I'm sorry. I, I, uh, let, me, let me restate that. For the three uh, individuals who have stood up for um, the available appointments for the library board and the same thing for the Marin County Commission on Aging. The incumbents, yes. I move the three incumbents. Okay. I'll second the motion. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Hilmer? Yes. Mayor Harrell? So that, yes, so that motion passes. Do we need to separately appoint the new member to the library board? So I'll so, move to, take a motion okay. on that. I'll move and thank you, Amir, for I see you're in the audience. So thank you very much for being in the audience and thank you for applying. And I look forward to working with you in the library board. So I appoint, uh, I um, move uh, the appointment of Amir and I'm uh, uh, sorry, I'll probably mangle your last name, but Movagji for the library board. Proudly second that. Okay. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Helmer? Yes. Mayor Hara? Yes. Okay, so that takes care of those two boards. Let's go to Measure B. We have two um, uh, candidates for the op one open position on this committee. Um, uh, I'll open it for comment first before asking for a motion. Um, my comment is I, I just really appreciate Kathleen and Larry Chu stepping forward. Um, uh, and I really um, love to see that we have new, um, a, a new community members who are stepping forward for boards uh, in general. Would you like a motion? Um, do we need to ask the public on this one? You, you should provide an opportunity for the public yeah. to comment. Yeah, let's let's do that right now. Is there anyone, um, Allison, from the public who wants to comment? Yes, our first comment will come from Elise Simonian. Oh, good, good. I'm glad we asked. <laughs> Thank you. So, Elise, go ahead. Thank you, Council. I just wanted to say that I, I really do um, have a lot of admiration for Mr. Chu and Given that there's a position coming up soon, I would just recommend um, I would be in support of appointing Kathy Slot to the position because she is someone new from the community that's offering to step into a volunteer position and um, knowing that we do have another opportunity down the line for um, someone else to be appointed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else out there? Looking for any further raised hands or email comments, and there's no public comment. Okay, all right, well, let's bring it back to the council. And I think we need a motion to appoint a new member, and uh, we'll defer on the uh, open position. Uh, council Member Way. Uh, thank you, Elise, for those comments. Um, and I agree, I'd like to um, nominate uh, Kathleen Slot for the Measure B committee. Um, in the one appointment at this particular time that we have available. Oh, okay. That's my nomination. Um, do we have a second? I'm not hearing a second on that. Um, I don't think we can move forward on the motion unless we have a second. So do we have an alternative motion? Uh, I value uh, the comments offered and I agree that we could probably encourage um, whoever's not selected to consider applying for the open slot that opens up in July. But based on the interviews um, and, the, and the quality of the responses to questions asked, I, I have to uh, 
feel that nominating Larry Chu is in the best interest of the city at this time for this particular appointment. Um, okay. Um, so, I'll, have, so, I'll, so I'll move. I'd have to, uh, yeah, I'd have to Mr. agree Chu. with that. You can, you're going to make that motion. So I'll move uh, that we select Mr. Chu and encourage Kathleen to follow up uh, and uh, apply for the uh, slot that's going to open up in July. Okay. Um, do we have a second? I'll, I'll second that because I think they're both equally, I think they're both qualified. I, yeah. I just am very encouraging of getting more people uh, from our community involved in the public process. And I appreciated that she stepped forward. And I know uh, in the closing comments that uh, Larry Chu said, he was also in support of uh, bringing in new community members to our processes. So hopefully we will see both of them. Fortunately, the timing is such that we probably well, will, but I don't want to preclude um, any outcome on the second one. But we have a motion to appoint um, Larry Chu. We have a second on that motion. I guess we need a vote. Council Member Way? Yes. Vice Mayor Hilburn? Yes. Mayor Hara? Yes. Um, so the motion uh, passes, and if Kathleen is out there listening in, um, please take our our expressions of hope that she keeps her her finger in the pie here. So also, just to, I would also comment, and, and this is an encouragement to uh, reach out to the city uh, staff, even the city council members or uh, oversight committee members, to learn exactly what the focus and role of the committee is uh, prior to the interview. I would just encourage that for all uh, people applying for yep. these positions. Of course. Thank you. Okay, so I think we've addressed what we need to do for that agenda item and we'll move to the last substantive agenda item, which is 8.4, which is an update on city activities and finances relating to COVID-19. I think this will be the last one, as I said. I, I, and I think you promised to stay at the last city council yeah. meeting, too. Uh, so that means I need to end on a high note. So I have two items to tell you. One is uh, we turned in the preliminary paperwork for the American Rescue Plan money. The state did finally provide some guidance to non-entitlement cities. Those are cities smaller than 50,000 about how to obtain the money. So um, we will probably have an agenda item with the council uh, either in August or September to talk about options for the, that, those funds. Um, and then the other thing is uh, because Cal OSHA delayed its direction on uh, masks and other COVID restrictions to a decision that they're making tomorrow, um, we maintained the status quo in City Hall this week. Uh, once the Cal OSHA guidelines have been approved and I understand the governor intends to then impose them immediately or implement them immediately by executive order, then okay. we'll begin to transition. Um, some, we will start to more, uh, start to open city hall more. Uh, but one of our challenges is not so much COVID, it's actual staff people. So we're, we're mapping that out now, you know, we're still hiring, we're bringing back people, particularly in the library. So some of our options are limited there. Um, and we're still examining the mask issue in the library because we do have a lot of children uh, in the library and we've had a lot of parents asking us about what our plan is given the number of children who want to come into the library. So uh, we'll probably take a look at that a little longer and we're asking what some of the other libraries intend to do. Okay, so that seems that's prudent. it. That seems great. So I was uh, at the, my, my COVID story for today is I uh, Today, I'm glad to announce that for this is the first day in 18 months that I've been able to go to the YMCA and not wear a mask. Unfortunately, the folks working there all had to wear a mask, but I'm hoping that the OSHA determination will provide some relief to them. Uh, and go ahead, I'm sorry, to, Catherine. Are you able to publicly announce some of the numbers um, that the recovery plan? I, I got an email from another city council member from another city which showed the chart um, that uh... so each city is told what their 
eligible to claim, and then you go through a claims process. So Larkspur is eligible to claim up to $2.9 million. Um, we are, uh, it comes in two increments. It's really yeah. easy to file the first claim because it's, for us anyway, that's easy for us to justify. Uh, we're, working the, we're working on the paperwork now to make sure we have a valid claim for the second half of the money. So. Okay. Um, and that it, was and, a number I saw on the on the spreadsheet. So yeah, it's it's um, it's the primary challenge is you have to make sure you're documenting how COVID impacted the city financially in a compliant way, and so it's not necessarily exactly the way we might think of it in the way we do our accounting. So that's what the challenge is right now, sort of translating into something to make sure we'll be fine. But I, I feel optimistic we'll, we'll be able to justify the entirety. Yeah. Well, we're counting on that. <laughs> okay, uh, any other comments or questions on this item? Seeing none, uh, we will move to agenda item number nine, which is adjournment. And I will ask for a motion in a second. So moved. Second. Uh, and hearing no objection, um, uh, it's unanimous, and we are adjourned. Oh, Mr. Mayor. I oh, I'm sorry. I have to make. I think one the vice vote. mayor had a request. Yes, yes he did, a, and and I I apologize for for that. I had the paper right in front of me. I want to make sure that as we adjourn, um, we do so in the memory. And I'll invite Vice Mayor and Homer to add to this. Um, adjourn in the memory of Alex R. Denny, um, age 26 who passed on November 1st, 2020. He lived at uh, 73 Heather Way. His parents were Suzanne and Daryl Denny. Um, Eric was a gifted young man, a gifted musician. He was a good student and a supreme athlete and his family and his community will miss him. And I would invite um, uh, the vice mayor to add anything in addition to that. Uh, just a, a very, uh tragic loss for the neighborhood. Alex was a valued uh, community member, loving son. Uh, on the corner, always at the Little League games, his parents were Little League leaders and just yeah. a, a, a tragic loss, unexpected. And uh, we miss him. He was much loved. Memorial is uh, at the Travis Bar at Cavallo Point uh, Friday, oh. June 18th at uh, 6 p.m. Okay, well, thank you for that. And then, then the additional information on that. It's just heartbreaking to see somebody that young um, pass away. So I think uh, with that uh, addendum to the adjournment motion, we are adjourned. Good night, everyone. Thank Good night. You.